as well. You might want to have one of those. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's recording now. So, uh, everybody else is muted apart from me and Liz, hopefully. Um, cool. Well, welcome everybody to this Zoom Zoom meeting, which is a um, uh, virtual ones forum meet, and the theme is P40s, and it's uh, really good to see so many people here. Uh, we've got lots of people watching, and lots of people are going to be taking part. I think so. Um, I see we've actually rolled over to two pages, which we didn't do last time. Um, and our first uh, guest today will be Liz Needham, who is a P40 owner and pilot and display pilot. Many people know her from the air show scene. Um, and she'll be followed by her husband, Frank Parker, who is also a P40 owner, pilot and display pilot. And he's going to give us a little bit of a talk about uh, the P40 guns. And um, then hopefully uh, Reg Wellington, I'm not sure if he's here yet, uh, our veteran is going to give a bit of a talk uh, about his time flying P-40s in World War II. And um, we might also get some thoughts from Alan Emmett as well, who is another veteran of uh, World War II who flew P-40s at Ohaku as well. So no, Alan's here. Uh, and then we'll go to David Duxbury, who is the historian, um, spends a lot of time in the Air Force Museum and really knows his stuff and he's going to give us a talk on um, number 15 squadron, RNZAF, uh, flying their P-40s up in the Pacific um, in uh, um, Tonga and then they went to Espirito Santo and up to Guadalcanal um, on their first tour. And uh, we'll end the event uh, with John Saunders who's going to give us a walk around of um, the um, P-40s in his hangar. He's got two sitting there at the moment. One is his own P-40E that he's restoring and the other one is P-40N NZ3220 uh, Glory Alliance, which at the moment he and, and a team are um, partially restoring, I guess, reassembling uh, so it can go on display. And that's come out of John Smith's um, collection. And uh, so that's that's the lineup for today. I'd like to um, first hand over to Phil Treweek, who's going to give us a bit of a uh, a rundown on the technical technical side for people who haven't done this before. So um, Phil, okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, there's only a couple of things to really worry about. If you're not one of the speakers, then it's a good idea to stay muted. Uh, that way, we don't get a whole lot of background noise going on. I've been muting people as they've come in, so if you wondered why, you might wasn't doing anything, that's the reason. Uh, if you're not uh, an experienced Zoom user, just a couple of tips. You uh, are probably coming in in speaker view, which means I will be filling the screen at the moment, and you'll see a row across the top of people. If you look in the top right-hand corner of your screen, uh, you might see a button that says gallery view. That allows you to see everyone else, um, which is how I'm looking at you. Um, if, if you like to see what else is going on around the place, otherwise you'll find the, the speaker will be up in front of you. Um, I think the only hiccup we had last time was uh, a couple of times someone clicked the share screen button and suddenly we were all looking at what you had on your desktop. Um, so try to, try to avoid that. If someone does do it, I will unshare it straight away. Um, is there anything else to worry about, Dave? I don't think so. Um, I, I should say that at the end of each uh, talk, there will be, um, you know, a brief period for questions as well um, for each speaker. And if there's anything at the end, we'll have a bit of a quick general discussion as well. Um, you know, if anyone thinks of questions along the way that they want to put to any of the speakers. Um, Frank's got to shoot away in about an hour, so, um, but I think all the others will be around. Um, I'm just hoping that Reg actually arrives otherwise otherwise Alan's going to have to be our <laughs> number one <laughs> World War II veteran um, but uh, yeah no I think I think that's good I think we um, we pretty much are ready to go so I'd like to hand it over to Liz Needham who's currently at um, at Ardmore and uh, where her P40 is based over to you Liz 
Thanks, Dave. I've, I've been thinking about um, <laughs> it's such a big topic and so much history with the kitty hawk. And my area of expertise is right now here in 2020. And so I could just go back um, a few years, say back to 2015, when I started to display the uh, kitty hawk, uh, CAG, uh, solo, and as well in formation. But of course, you, you don't just do that. <laughs> you need all those years of practice um, building up to be able to do that. In fact, you get invited by the airshow organizers and in, invited by the other team members. So I've had a long history of fl flying tail draggers and Harvards, and I own my own Harvard. Um, the experience came from flying the Harvard. I have to give the Harvard all the credit. Um, you've heard of formation and safety training fast. That's very big here at Ardmore. And I managed to um, get into that, be a um, ticked off as a leader and get some experience out flying formation. And then, of course, the close formation came in the Harvards with being invited to join the Roaring Forties. And <laughs> not many of us in our forties anymore, but the, <laughs> the Roaring Forties was close formation flying and a display and all the disciplines that uh, go with it. So I found getting into the Kitty Hawk, and remember I had quite a bit of time up in the Kitty Hawk um, at this point where, in fact, Frank um, did most of my training and we did a few flights on a T-28 here at Ardmore. And so I thought, yep, I'm, I'm ready to, if I'm invited to join Keith Skilling and the Corsair and Stu Goldspink and his E-model P-40. And then eventually, because Frank was always the, the pilot in that, and eventually I was able to wrestle him out of the front seat and get the keys myself as my shares grew in the P-40. And I remember Stu saying to me, but, what can you do? And I says, well, I can fly formation. I can do a loop and a roll. This is great. You can come along with my number two. We'll put Keithy in the, he can lead in the Corsair and Stu was number three. And we started doing just a, just a couple, of, couple of displays. Uh, loops, pretty exciting stuff. And then tail chase, half Cubans. It's, it's really, really thrilling, really exciting, and a great honour to be flying the Kitty Hawk and to be asked by those guys. Um, the briefings by Keith in the Kitty Hawk were, oh, just follow me. And um, when we do the Cuban, just keep your eyes glued to me because I'll, be, I'll disappear. And remember, at the bottom of the half Cuban, remember to pull out. Don't be so transfixed that... You know, you don't pull out. And so the briefings were very good, right to the point. And looking across at the, the two guys while you're flying the Kitty Hawk, thinking, gosh, I'm in a Kitty Hawk, flying with these big, big guys. And Keith's face, just a big grin. And Stu's face, just a big grin. And so you relax. And it's all over pretty quick. And it's very, 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 very neat, very, very satisfying. And I'm a very, very lucky girl for one lady owner and a kitty hawk. Um, I'd like to hand you over to Frank now. Frank's going to talk about the extra things our kitty hawk can do with its uh, six machine guns. And right behind me here, I have the actual ones that Frank shot out. I don't know if you can see them or not. Here we go. Oh, yeah. No, These are worth five bucks each. <laughs> Ten bucks now. Ten dollars. Hey everybody, um, Frank Parker, I'm the president of Warbirds, and whether that's an honour or not, I think it is. And I've been involved with these Warbird things for 20 plus years. In fact, I, I guess I've been involved in a lot longer than that because as a tender young age of about 19 and a half, I learnt to fly in a Harvard when I joined the Air Force. And I guess my involvement in the warbird scene has come of, as a direct result of that. When I left the Air Force and got into the airline game, is funny enough, my initial instructor on the friendship conversion was Keith Skilling. And 
he had a Harvard project going at the time and he says, hey, you need to get involved in this. Long story short, I did. And that led to uh, sort of a similar story to Liz's, but a few years pr prior, is getting invited to join Roaring Forties. And then from the Roaring Forties, I guess my break in the Kitty Hawk came by Garth Hogan, who had rebuilt CAG along with Charles Darby. And Garth was uh, looking to subsidise his insurance bill, I guess, and invited a few uh, people who he thought were appropriate to fly the thing. I managed to muscle in on that and uh, got to fly to Kitty Hawk, and it sort of grew from there. When Garth rebuilt CAG, uh, I guess he, he is a visionary, is he decided that he wanted a Kitty Hawk that he could put the guns in and he could fire these 50 cows out of. And so in the rebuild process, the wing was constructed so that the guns could be fitted to it. It wasn't quite that easy uh, because putting guns in a kitty hawk you think was not too straightforward, but it wasn't. But as time progressed and uh, Garth wanted to demonstrate these guns, he made some inquiries. So I believe the story goes along this line as he went to the police and says, I want to put these guns in a P40 and shoot some blanks out of it. And they says, oh yeah, <laughs> tell, us, tell us another story. But he says, well, how do the war horse people get away from it? get away with doing exactly that. They have uh, 50 cal guns and et cetera on their jeeps and other bits and pieces and fire artillery pieces with blanks, et cetera. And the short story was they were doing a historical reenactment. And Garth says, exactly right. We're going to do a historical reenactment of shooting up Japanese barges on the beaches of um, New Guinea. And the policeman says, oh, yeah, we can see where you're going. And the next hurdle was, uh, with the CAA people, who said, well, that comes under dropping articles from aircraft because you've got all these 50 cal shells falling out the bottom of the aeroplane. But we were, I guess, fortunate at the time in that the people in the CAA could see what we were trying to do. They were sympathetic to the course. And so we went down the process of doing it. And our first demonstration was at Wanaka, I think, eight years ago. So the, the first point is that the aircraft was rebuilt that we get the guns in it. The second point was that the guns were available, and that was courtesy Charles Darby, who had um, secured these things from his travels around the Pacific. And the third and fourth points were the cooperation of the police and the uh, CAA to enable us to do it. Now you think just put a couple of guns in a P-40 and pull a trigger would be quite simple. In fact, it's quite a, a complex job. The, the guns have to be serviced each time we put them in and out. The, the um, authorities, of course, aren't happy with us leaving them in the aircraft, so we put them in the aircraft for specific occasions. That's the sort of a two-day job for a couple of trained people. Then we've got to, uh, as I said, service the guns and get the ammunition for them and make sure they all function and fix up the solenoids that aren't working, et cetera, et cetera, test firing them, and it, it does go on and on. But eventually we get there. And uh, it's, it's quite a, well, I believe, quite a showstopper. And I guess uh, Liz and I uh, are pretty lucky in that we're probably the only people who fire some guns out of a P-40, albeit we're firing blanks, um, since World War II, shortly thereafter. When the guns go in the aircraft, it gives you a new appreciation of what it's all about. As we tend to look at these old aeroplanes in the air show scene and say, oh, that's beautiful, and all that lovely Spitfire lines, and all that, oh, look at that Mustang, isn't it gorgeous? And, oh, the old Kitty Hawk over there, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we look at them for their, what they are as an aircraft. When you put these weapons in it and pull a trigger and these 50 cows rattle off, you suddenly get a, it's not a, it's not a pretty aeroplane anymore. It's actually, it's a, it's a fighting machine. And that's what the whole point of the whole airplane was, was to put guns and bombs and such like on it and go and wage war. It, it wasn't built to look pretty in a hangar or anything like that. And pulling the old trigger and having 650 cows to rattle off certainly brings that home to exactly what it's all about. And it's a pretty impressive little uh, thing that happened is that um, the Kitty Hawk's quite spartan for anybody who knows it. And it's pretty noisy in the cockpit. You pull the trigger and you certainly know that there's some guns rattling on just until you left and your right. 
it uh, doesn't shake the airframe because a lot of the recoil in the guns is taken up and the automatic mechanism as the firing blocks go backwards and forwards. But it does rattle the airplane. Uh, you can hear the guns firing, no doubt about that. Um, there's a great spray of smoke and, and flame out each wing. And of course, the cockpit fills up with that lovely cordite smell. It's quite invigorating. And that's about it. Well, um, thanks, Frank and Liz. Um, we'll probably um, take some questions, but I have a question first, and that is, can you tell us about the fact that uh, people can go for a ride in your P40 and, and uh, how can they do it? Uh, yes, we, it's, it's pretty neat, the um, part 115 company that we have. Um, we've got three fighters in it, a Mustang and... Spitfire and Kitty Hawk. Um, I mainly do the Kitty Hawk flights. Uh, people can book for the flight and they can shop at Ardmore. They can get the full walk around, put on the flight suit, and we go out and do a 30 minute flight. We call it a part 115 flight. It's, um, it costs 2,800 New Zealand dollars. Um, it's not as popular as the Spitfire. Everybody wants to fly the Spitfire, <laughs> but we have the Kitty Hawk available. And the most important thing is, it, it means that this Kitty Hawk can earn its own money. And as you know, a girl needs to earn her own money. <laughs> uh, I just add a couple of things. To that is, is one one part one one five we talk about is, is civil aviation, venture aviation rule which we operate under and uh, it's been up in vogue for I'm guessing eight years, ten years or something. It took them 60 years to get it but finally they did and so it enables uh, us to operate these aircraft and lots of other, part 115 covers everything ballooning to gliding to hang gliding to non-certificated aircraft which is where we come up. And as Liz says the importance of it for warbirds is that it enables the owners of these aircraft to take people for rides and make a bit of an income from it. Uh, it's no way that it covers all the costs, or well, there's no way anybody's going to retire from it, but it does offshoot some of the costs of owning these things. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty popular ride. It, as Liz says, we also operate a Doug Brooker Spitfire under the 115, and it's a little bit more expensive. That's about 4,300, I think, for a 30 minute flight. It, it never ceases to amaze me how people, everybody in New Zealand wants to go for a ride in a Spitfire, whereas uh, to me the Kitty Hawk is far more important to New Zealand RNZAF history than what the Spitfire is. is the RNZAF operated 250 odd Kitty Hawks. Um, we operated Spitfire squadrons, but we didn't actually operate Spitfires in the RNZAF. The, the, most people who go for a ride in a P40 are actually Australians, because they have a much better um, appreciation of the aircraft and what it did during World War II and often if anybody sees me commenting on aviation posts if there's anything about the Kitty Hawk I always put the Pacific Fighter and historians can prove otherwise or, or straighten me up <laughs> I guess but to me is the RNZF Kitty Hawks were the aircraft that shot down all the Japanese in the Pacific. The Corsairs came along got all the glory but they actually didn't do much. They, they did a lot of ground attack but it was the Kitty Hawks, which were in the midst of it in the beginning, and it's the Aussie Kitty Hawks, which were right in the midst of it in uh, New Guinea. And if anybody, if you haven't heard about Milne Bay, uh, you should read about it because it's the first defeat of the Japanese in the Pacific, the first defeat of the Japanese in the war. It was only a small action, went on for about four or five days. The Kitty Hawks were right in the guts of it, and, and if you read the stories, they were taking off from the airstrip as they got the gear up. They were then pushing over into the attack of these uh, the Japanese who were trying to overrun them. So uh, that, that's uh, the big one, or, or it's one of the more important ones. You ask any Aussie military person about Milne Bay, and they will uh, they'll have your ear for the next two or three hours. Whereas in New Zealand, we just in fact I can even enlarge on that. I spent 16 years in the Air Force, and I knew everything about the about the uh, New Zealand involvement in the in the European war, but after 16 years in the Air Force, I knew virtually nothing 
about New Zealand involvement in the Pacific War. And it's just, it's, it was just one of those sideshows, it seems, whereas um, I'm sure the historians will agree, it was actually a little bit more than a sideshow. And there's a lot of New Zealand involvement there, but for some reason, uh, and I guess it's our English heritage and the fact that until the Brits joined the common market, we were anchored 50 metres or 50 miles off of Southampton, is that everything in New Zealand when I was growing up was English. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> just, just I to, totally agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Dave, you've got friends started. <laughs> well, um, the other thing is your actual aircraft was up there in New Guinea with the Royal Australian Air Force and... Um, you know, that's, that's a genuine combat veteran, isn't it? That's right. And, and I guess uh, it's been a huge privilege. I've actually uh, taken two guys who flew the aircraft in New Guinea for a flight in it. Um, that, that's pretty special. Yeah. Yeah, guys who actually flew that aeroplane. Um, one of them is a typical old digger, as you would expect from Perth. And he sort of says, oh, yeah, 60 years between Kitty Hawk flights. Not too bad, is it? <laughs> Uh, the other thing is, on this Zoom call right now, we've actually got Neville Mines as well, and he was one of the ones who uh, recovered your aircraft back in the 1970s, didn't you, Nev? You have to unmute if you're going to speak. Try that. Try that. Yeah, it was uh, me and Monty Armstrong went up. Um, Bunny Darby was uh, working for Dave Talashay. And Monty was was uh, Dave Talashay's chief engineer, and he wanted another hand. And because I'd been brought up about 200 yards away from Motat and knew all the guys there from the word go, Monty said, "Hey, can you get some time out of the Air Force to come and give me a hand to get some airplanes?" I said, "Yeah, that sounds a good idea to me." So I had about six weeks leave, and I went up with Monty to Tadji, and we pulled out your Kitty Hawk, uh, a bunch of other Kitty Hawks, and some Beauforts. It was um, good fun. Didn't get paid for the job, but it was all expenses paid holiday. Well, holiday, um, hardly. But um, yeah, it was a, a very interesting uh, exercise and one that a lot of people are very envious about. It wasn't without its uh, problems. The aircraft would get so hot that you couldn't just lean your bare skin against them because you'd burn yourself. If you got any small scratch or nick, it would instantly go septic on you. And because they'd been sitting up there for so long, uh, full of things like snakes and scorpions, which I'm not very keen on at all. <laughs> and um, look at her now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've seen it a few times at the shows. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, it was, a, it was a, a, a good time in my life, real good. Yeah, and, and a good result too, Nev. Thank you. So yeah, has, anyone, has anyone got any questions for Liz and Frank? If you have, uh, put up your hands and um, uh, Matt Austin, what? make sure you unmute yourself when you go to, yep. Thanks Dave, thank you Liz, thank you Frank. Um, what's, I'm just wondering what sort of, um, obviously I'd like to park my backside in the backseat of P40, probably more so than in Spitfire. Um, given the Aussie connection and all, uh, what sort of a time, you know, how far out would one need to book a flight? Because I turn 50 next year and I've just had a brainwave about what I'm going to tell the lovely Minister for War Finance and External Affairs what I'd like to do. Dave's been um, gently suggesting for quite some time that I come back to um, New Zealand, so I think we could tie things in very nicely. So given that I'm looking at July next year, what sort of a time frame would I need if I was to get things going to book a seat in the back, please? Yeah, uh, uh, good question. Uh, anything from six months to six minutes, I guess. We, we literally had people uh, arrive on the airfield and they've timed it right and, and the aircraft's been available, the pilot's been available, and the weather's been available and we've gone there and then. But generally people uh, yeah, work on a, a month or two out uh, and then... We, we do the flights pretty much uh, by as required. Fabulous, thank you very much. I, I think now that I've um, <clears throat> aired, aired it on a, uh, one of Dave's fabulous forums, I better stick to it, so um, I will be in touch. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Good one, Matt. <laughs> cool, uh, other questions? 
put your hand up if you have a question. Uh, Carl Winter, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks, everybody, and thanks uh, to the P40 operators that are joining the conversation tonight. It's been really exciting. I always thought, I expected the P40 to be larger than it is. It's there in the foreground. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we were talking about a toy, but it is a nice toy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, what is involved in, um, like for every hour in the air, how much uh, maintenance is required and what is involved in upkeeping a, a P-40 to flying standards? Uh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's a pretty basic aeroplane. It's a 1930s design aeroplane. And so airframe wise, it's pretty straightforward. Not too, not too bad, not too much at all. Uh, remember that it was rebuilt from the ground up, so everything was in overhaul condition. Uh, the CAG has been flying for 20 years now and uh, in that time I think we've done 500 odd hours so it's had a much more successful second life than it ever did in its first life. The, the, I guess the major expense of maintenance seems to revolve around the engine. Uh, I, I compare it to Harvard which it's a similar vintage and the airframe is, is very very similar and as I said reasonably simple to, to maintain. The Harvard engine, the old big old radial, just seems to truck on and on and on, have no problems whatsoever. The Allison tends to be a little bit of a um, little bit of a fancy horse, and it seems to need a little bit more attention to keep it in fighting trim. In fact, it's not just the engine; it's more the accessories, and we've had problems with radiators leaking and uh, magneto problems and such like. But um, the basic engine itself is just is just fine. Cool. Uh, any other questions out there? Bevan Jews. Hey. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh -oh. It was um, good to hear a bit of your story, Liz. What was the spark that actually kind of got you into getting the Harvard and onto the P-40? Because, of course, not, not having the Air Force background and things, what, what got you into it? <laughs> well, the easy answer for that is Frank, of course, is we'd come out to Ardmore and he'd show me the harbour that he was rebuilding. And as he said, it's only three fifty a month and we're going in a couple of years. I could, say, I could see where this was going. I thought, oh, well, if you can't beat him, better join him. And anyway, I end up owning Harvard 5.7 and this is where we spend out here at Warbirds and flying Harvards. Um, all our weekends and of course we're a big part of Warbirds so I could see um, 20 years ago where this was starting to go in fact earlier than that <laughs> 25 years so being a smart blonde I thought yeah I better take an interest in this project so it's, it all comes back to the Harvard and Frank <laughs> that's awesome So are there any other questions out there? Uh, Baz. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Oh, that's good, because this laptop's pretty old. <laughs> um, yeah, so you've both, both of you have flown the Spitfires, the Mark 14 and, and, the, and the Mark 9, and of course P40. I was just wondering if someone put a gun to your head and said, look, you can only fly one of these for the rest of your life, is there one particular one you, you choose over the other? Depends which owners, uh, <laughs> depends which aircraft owner is closest to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess my answer first is, is, is the P40 is, is probably fair flying, possibly because I've got most experience in it, I feel most comfortable in it. It's a nice, honest aeroplane. It, it's uh, by no means fancy. It, as, as I've said before, it's 1930s technology. It's very manual but she's an honest old girl and it's not going to trip you up. Spitfire is obviously that iconic aeroplane. Uh, the Mark 9 is, is, it's actually not as nice to fly as a P-40. P-40 is nicer on the controls if you're for, for an aviation or for a pilot person. It just feels like it should. Um, whereas the Spitfire is a bit funny. The ailerons are a little bit slow and clunky and the elevators are very, very light. It's just not quite right, but it's this wonderful, wonderful historical aeroplane. The Mark 14, obviously, it's just a brute. It goes, it rattles and shakes and, 
uh, wonderful performance. And I guess I've got to say that the Mustang is a reason why they call it the Cadillac of the Skies. Uh, I, I, I think if I won Lotto, I'd be looking pretty closely at buying a Mustang. Yeah. Thank you much. Yeah. Interesting. So, any other questions out there? Zach Yates. Zach? Sorry about that, got it all sorted. Um, well, first off, I just wanted to say I have uh, my own little toy of Kura along here. Um, it's probably not going to show up too well on the screen, but there it is. Um, but my question is, it's another operational question, is what sort of currency do you need to maintain in an aircraft like the P40? Because I don't imagine it's just pop out to the airfield and kick the tyres and go for it every weekend or so. Um, good, good question, Zach, and we're very mindful of that. Um, we're lucky enough to be flying either the Spitfire or the Kitty Hawk most weekends. But, um, so to answer your question, 20 minutes every couple of weekends um, keeps us current. But I do make sure that um, when I've pre-flighted either the Kitty Hawk or the, or the um, Spitfire and sitting in it, I do sit there quietly and think, all right, <laughs> what am I in? Kitty Hawk. All right, what's going to kill me? I'll make sure I get the trim right. I'll check the flap lever, thinking, all right, it's different from the Harvard push up, push down, it goes the opposite from the Harvard. Um, slow look around. And then of course the Kitty Hawk, you've got to wind the canopy closed and you don't want to be reaching up and uh, going Spitfire to get it closed. And so you just have a quiet think, what am I in? And yeah, what's gonna get me? And um, just settle down, do your job, be professional and um, Keep yourself current. And of course, you'll then go back to the Harvard and fly that a little better. Yeah, I'll just add to what Lizzie said is really, once again, the entry to all these things is the dear old Harvard. And uh, if you have, haven't flown a Kenny Hawk or a Spitfire for a little while, then the first thing you do is go and fly a Harvard. And I think it was the words of Ray Hanna to um, Gar Pogan when he first got involved in this. He said, well, if you want to fly a Kitty Hawk, you get a Harvard, you do 50 hours, you go and fly your Kitty Hawk, and you come back and you can fly your Harvard even better. <laughs> so, so the entry level is that their old Harvard. It's a, it's a big, noisy, heavy, old tailwheel aeroplane, and you just can't beat it. That's the reason why it, it, it was uh, <laughs> the most important aeroplane of the whole of World War II, because it trained all the pilots. Well said. Brilliant, brilliant. So any last questions? Uh, oh, just looking around. David here. Yep. Uh, it's just a little boring thing, a technical thing, but I heard the word cordite mentioned earlier in relation to the guns and firing thereon. Now, my understanding is that the Americans didn't use cordite in their ammunition, so uh, they used uh, something called um, cellulose-based ex uh, explosives for their to fire the uh, shells. That was in World War II. I mean, I, things have probably changed, but I just wondered if if the smell of cordite mentioned earlier was, was actually the smell of cordite and not something else. <laughs> You're quite possibly right, David. And uh, <laughs> It's very obscure, I know. I've got to give it, I've got to tell you, I'm no chemist. Because uh, <laughs> apparently Britain <laughs> had, Britain had huge... Perhaps I'm harking back to, to, um, to my gun smoke comics or something. But anyway, you pull the trigger and it makes a noise and you get a smell of something in the cockpit. And mm. it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. 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 Apparently the British had the huge supply of cordite and they they swore by it. And that was right through World War One and World War Two. Yeah. Used for all, just about all their ammunition. Uh, and they got it from somewhere in Central America or South America, I think. But the Americans uh, eschewed it and they didn't like it. And, they, and of course the uh, propellant they used was much cleaner. Yeah, British British guns and all British aircraft required you know, very frequent, vigorous uh, maintenance and brushing out the barrels and things, cleaning them up because the cordite was just a very dirty propellant, it made a mess of everything. And that's in fact the modifying the Browning gun originally for the Royal Air Force in the twenties, I think they they had to do a major modifications to get it to work with British propellant. 
you know, it worked fine okay. with the original American stuff. Anyway, that's just a by the by. Yeah, I can add that I mentioned it takes a couple of days to put the, the guns in the aircraft and get them functional. It takes a couple of days to get them out and another two days to clean out the gun bays because they are absolutely full of guns from, yeah. uh, from the weapons operating. And it's uh, they, the text tell us it's uh, quite corrosive as well. So we've got to make a good job of cleaning it all up. Very interesting. Well, uh, any one, one or two last questions? Um, I, I have one, um, Dave, and that's I'd like to um, introduce um, Brett Nichols because it's all about the new younger pilots sure. uh, joining the Kitty Hawk fraternity. And Brett's oh, got a, a project over at um, Pioneer. So his is a couple of years away. But this is Brett, and he's here with his son, Lachlan. So... It's our job is now as the senior pilots and owners to be looking at uh, these new younger guys coming along who'll be in in the hot seat in the next year or two. So this Absolutely. is great. Mm. Thanks, Liz. Thanks for coming. Obviously, obviously the uh, the path has been well set by Liz and Frank of um, and Garth and people like that. But you know we've got. Um, okay, see Frank. Frank's just going. Um, uh, you know you've got two amazing operators here, so it's. Um, you know, all, uh, as I say, um, we're very, very lucky to have people like Liz and Frank uh, who, who can guide us um, in the future. And of course, Lachlan, my uh, son over there, he might he might do it one day too. So maybe these three generations of 40 pilots in the room, who knows? That's fantastic. Um, I've known about your project for a while, of course, Brett. Uh, yeah. You've been help, helping with the um, history of it. And it's... Sorry? Very generous with your time. Thanks, Dave. Oh, been... yeah, no worries. No, it's, it's fun. Yeah, I, I enjoy it. Um, but no, it's really good to see that it's out in the open now. And um, and uh, I'm really, really looking forward to seeing that aircraft fly. It's uh, it's NZ3147. Correct. And um, give us a little uh, rundown on its history. Uh, it's got a really interesting history. Um, uh, saw combat in the Southwest Pacific in the uh, first half of 1944. Correct me if I'm wrong. As for, uh, uh, first half of 1944, up in um, Guadalcanal, uh, Cactus, um, Cactus Island. Um, it's uh, obviously Kiwi one. Um, it's got the infamy of shooting down. It's got one kill, and that's shooting down of, a, of another New Zealand uh, <laughs> P40 at, at Gisborne. It's, uh, I believe they were jumping from an E model to an E model, and uh, and I'm going to get this wrong way around, but in the E. Um, the few, uh, the um, a button had to be pushed, the fuse had to be uh, pushed out and then the end model had to be pushed in and they jumped from one to the other and got it mixed up and when they were practicing uh, tail chasing, he pulled the trigger and shot another, shot another P40 down. So it's, a, it's, got, a, it's got a great history. So we, we will have a New Zealand flag parked on the side of us. <laughs> we believe we probably had it at some point but we'll, we'll add it to um, the project's been with Pioneer for a long, long time when I bought it. So they had a few parts and they're gonna put, uh, rebuild it. So um, it'll be a, um, a true New Zealand P40 rebuilt at Ardmore, because it was at Ardmore. It, went to, it was with, uh, uh, um, went all over the country like many of these port, um, P40s did, Woodburn and Hakia, Gisborne, uh, Ardmore. So um, yeah, it's, 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 it's great that we can um, obviously get it rebuilt here. It's also good that we're keeping um, in these uncertain times that people like Pioneer have um, a solid amount of work. Um, what, 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 you know, obviously there's a Frank's P40 and, um, and this one, that, you know, we're, we're keeping these skill sets in New Zealand, and, as I say, in, in these difficult times. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much, Brett. Has anyone got any oh. questions for Brett? Any hands? I can't see any hands. So, and thanks, Dave. Probably yeah. what we'll do now is we'll um we'll get onto our warbird stuff for today, and then we'll just catch up with your forum um at, at the end of the day. And you're going to put it on YouTube, I understand? Yeah, hopefully that this is recording now. So, so long as it all goes well, um, this will be on YouTube. So, um, yeah, you can watch the rest later. All right. Um, I think it's the Harvard flight coming up. Ah, yep. Oh, excellent. Dave, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate it. Thanks. See you. Bye.
Well, um, what we'll do now is uh, we'll bring in our next speaker, who is Reg Wellington. Um, Reg has turned up, which is great. Uh, can I see Reg? Where's he gone again? But there he is. So, Reg, uh, if you can turn on your um, microphone, or if someone can. Uh, Phil, can you turn on Reg? I've enabled it, but he's going to have to unmute himself. Ah, okay. You seem to be muted, Reg, so... We're not hearing anything from you, Rich. Can you unmute yourself? There's a down in the left hand corner. Oh, it looks can like you you're on now. Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah, we got uh, you now. <laughs> That's it. I turn. I came in ten minutes late. Maybe yeah, no worries. <laughs> I didn't hear. I uh, didn't have anything. But uh, no one I'm here, and uh, it's going to be all go. Okay. I, I was rather interested in. Uh, um, what was going on with the talk about uh, shooting 0.5s on a P40. Uh, we were taught that the P40 was the platform uh, from which to shoot. And uh, the aircraft was always the platform. And uh, you always had to, uh, to use, treat it as such. Um, uh, there was another thing too, and that was the DVAs. I don't know whether Liz has uh, uh, DVAs in her um, uh, P40. Um, where we uh, had to spend time learning DVAs. Uh, I've got a whole list of them here. Um, and um, they, the trim, mixture, fuel, flaps, and the instruments. And uh, you had to do everything before you, before you left to go out to taxi. And um, one thing about the Allison engine, I don't know whether it's just still the same, but it heats up very quickly. And um, uh, down at Ohakia, uh was a pretty long taxiway out to the runway. We'd quite often um, get out there where the engines were getting pretty hot. And um, we had a flight commander by the name of Bill Delves, Flight Lieutenant Bill Delves. He finished up as the CO of 26 Squadron. And then he became finally the CO of 22 Squadron. But um, um, at Ohakia, you'd look in the distance and there'd be a Hudson or something like that, away back seven miles over Palmerston on final. And the tower would be telling us to stay where you are, stay where you are. Bill Dills would say, follow me. And away we'd go on the grass. And uh, uh, that was what we had the name for, I think. Fighters were always taken off on the grass to save us boiling over. Wow. Wow. I don't know if there's anything else that I can say that um, uh, Liz probably hasn't told you. She, she flies on these days. Um, I, I don't know whether I, one thing I didn't like about the P-40, I suppose, was the fact that you strapped yourself into it and you felt part of the aircraft, that you were sort of inside it. Uh, whereas uh, perhaps a Corsair, you were more sitting up on top, but I still like the Corsair to fly a lot better, uh, mainly because it can go a lot faster, climb a lot higher, and uh, that was my, 39 was my pet of an aircraft. Right. C can you tell us about your first flight in a P-40? My first flight in a P-40, um, it wasn't uh, unusual, I don't think, um, uh, for a start, uh, P-40 was the first aircraft that I wasn't able to fly dual in. And uh, all I had was an instructor uh, leaning over the corner behind my shoulder um, as he pointed out everything to me. And uh, then I sort of left on my own. And um, I think it, uh, it all went off pretty straightforward. Um, all I think I did was a circle. It was um, my uh, fourth flight um, at Ardmore. Um, it was actually 
uh, the day after my first flight. So we did three Harvard flights uh, in one day, and the next day I got in, I went and sat on a, on a uh, Kitty Hawk and um, uh, did a couple of flights on that. And uh, there was nothing unusual about it, except that all we did was circuits and landing. Um, John, I think, has um, got a syllabus of um, a, an OTU um, course, uh, which he will know whether what we actually did was what was in the syllabus. Well, I think it was pretty well. We didn't have much of an opportunity to, uh, to do our own thing. Um, we were either um, uh, in the Harvard doing instrument work uh, with one of our mates. The first time we did instrument work, I think, was with an instructor. The second time was with an instructor, and after that, they got service, and we went up with one of our uh, uh, flight mates. And uh, Phil Lightband was a chap I went up a couple of times with, and um, um, we did that. Uh, so once a week, we'd do a Harvard flight, and uh, we'd do Kitty Hawk flying. Uh, there was only one opportunity that I had to, to get away on my own, and um, I decided I'd fly up to Stratford. Um, that was where home was, and um, I knew that I had an hour to spare, and um, I took off. Uh, when we were at Siberia, we lived in huts. Uh, we were the poor relation when it came to me living at, uh, um, at uh, Hakia, because that was the home of number two. They lived on base. And we lived in Siberia, which was a two-man hut establishment. And um, whether I said anything to my mate and what I was going to do that day, I don't know. But I remember taking off and I was heading quite nicely along towards Stratford on a beautiful day. I looked out the starboard wing and there was a, another P-40 following me. And um, I wondered what he, who it was, but fortunately, um, it was only my mate. And um, we went up. We... We kept well out of Stratford's way. Um, a previous course pilot, my name of Bob Jans, he had flown up. Um, he beat up the town clock, town clock and um, got potted by somebody, perhaps a lonely policeman, I don't know, but uh, his number was picked and uh, he got ripped up when he got back to uh, Ohakia. So I kept well clear of Stratford. I went up and circled the farm uh, Mum came out and waved his teeth out at me, and we went back. Um, five days later, my hut mate was dead, and um, that was the first uh, time that I'd experienced anybody being killed in an aircraft. Um, but um, we did. Uh, we were kept busy uh, with formation work. Uh, of course, we'd gone away from the three aircraft formation. We'd gone to four where there was more protection on uh, each of you. Uh, we did scissor work, uh, uh, even on a, on a flat, uh, straight uh, course. We would be scissoring all the time. Uh, we scissored when we turned uh, onto another angle. Uh, everybody crossed over. Uh, number three crossed uh, below number one and two. Uh, number four crossed number three. Uh, and uh, we all got used to keeping us the right distance. But um, uh, we did a bit of gunnery. We did the um, um, Kitty Hawk, of course. Um, it was well known that the Kitties shot down 99 Japanese aircraft, and uh, whether they made the 100 or not, I don't know. But uh, when we got up there, there were no Japanese aircraft in the air, and all of our work was... Um, assisting the Australian ground troops, uh, bombing ahead of them, um, and uh, sort of uh, helping them out. So um, uh, we, have, we struck no aircraft in the air at all. So there wasn't any need for air-to-air -air gunnery, mm -hmm. but uh, air-to-ground gunnery, we did quite a bit of that. And um, uh, that was what our course was mainly about, teaching us to... Uh, uh, use our aircraft as a platform for for shooting and for for bombing. 
What, what was the, um, the circuit like when you're coming back into Ohaki? Was it quite a busy circuit there with so many OTUs operating? It, it was busy uh, uh, with uh, Kitty Hawks. Uh, not so much there was the odd um, twin engine aircraft around, but um, uh, there was not much in the way of anything bigger. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't all that bad, really. Uh, we didn't get anything uh, uh, out of the way. Uh, in fact, uh, it was rather a, a charm sort of a life. Um, even at Ardmore, there was nothing. There was only Corsairs at Ardmore, uh, so we had nothing to worry about there. But um, uh, our here, um, you had a long runway. There was um, a bomb dump at the end of um, runway 27. And um, there was one particular aircraft um, which had its um, uh, fuel um, uh, segment, uh, the, um, not the gauge, but the, um, the fuel tank. Uh, calibration, uh, there was your left tank, your right tank, your full tank, and then there was your uh, both tanks, and then there was your uh, belly tank. And there was one aircraft where that quadrant was wrong. And um, I don't know how I came to pick that aircraft that day, but I got down onto uh, uh, runway 27, and uh, there were four of us. And uh, at Ohakia, we would use both sides of the strip. Um, number one would go away on the left, number two on the right, number three on the left, number four on the right. And I opened up this bit of the day. I got halfway down the runway towards the bomb dump and the motor cut. And uh, that was as far as I went. And I remember yelling out now to Phil Lightband to pass me on the right, uh, which he did. And um, I was very ignominiously towed back um, by a little wagon back to the um, parking area and uh, turned out that I had that one aircraft where I hadn't read where I was going to put the uh, knob. I just put it automatically where I thought was both tanks. And um, nothing happened to me. They let me off. But um, uh, in a later course, one of my friends uh, who came from, who came from Taranaki. Um, he must have changed tanks midair, I think, because he was up over fielding and uh, his motor cut on him, the same aircraft, and he actually did well. He put it down on a fielding race course uh, without any damage, and uh, he never flew again. So well, that was the only thing that actually happened to me at um, uh, on my course. Uh, we lost one pilot uh, there, and uh, that was the only thing that happened. We did 60 hours uh, plus 20 hours in Harvard's, uh, which was all instrument flying, and we did quite a bit of uh, link trainer work. Link trainer was all, all the way through on each station. We did link trainer work. But there was very little time for us to uh, go up and uh, do what we wanted to do in the way of flying. Uh, if we went up and did formation work, um, perhaps at the end of the formation, um, we'd go out and we'd do a bit of follow the leader, where the leader would take off and he'd do a barrel roll or a loop or something like that. And uh, you'd follow him through the, uh, the circuits until it was time to come back and land. So that's about all I can tell you about um, being at um, uh, Harkir, I think, flying the uh, P-40s that had the red spinner. Yep. So w with your exercises that you did, Reg, uh, was there much, um, in the, w would you do a briefing in, uh, beforehand and a, and a debrief after, like, like being on the squadron? Was there that same sort of um, planning and, and then a debrief for, for everybody that was involved? Well, there was nothing, um, we didn't get anything like that until we got onto operations. There was nothing at um, Ahakia. Okay. Uh, briefing or debriefing, but uh, always at, um, up on the MRO and Bougainville, uh, it was all debriefing. Okay. Uh, 
mainly because we were working with the Australians. We would have an Australian uh, officer um, who would come in and tell us what he wanted us to do. And uh, then uh, we'd come back and he'd report on what we had done, how well we'd done it. Um, on several occasions, um, we had commendation from him from the Americans. Um, I don't know what they had to do with it, but uh, because they were sort of well to the north by then. Okay. Uh, was there much classroom work at the OTU as well, or what, had that all been covered before with, in the Harvard course? No, there was no, cl no classroom work. It was all flying. Okay, right. All flying, and uh, being at, um, I think number four OTU had started off over Ardmore, but I yeah. think when Corsairs arrived, they realised they couldn't have both Corsairs and, and uh, kiddies at the one place, so they brought them down to uh, Ohakia, and then, of course, they had to set up another camp because uh, number two uh, pilots, they had all the um, uh, main accommodation block, so they invented this place called Siberia, which was a hut camp, and um, uh, it was around where later on there was a museum. And we had to um, uh, walk to uh, work and walk home for lunch, walk back again and walk home in the night. And quite often uh, we'd catch a ride in a dominie or something like that, going around the taxiway. <laughs> but, but most times it was just walk. So when you say to work, uh, was um, was 40 o, four OTUs aircraft in one of the big hangars? Were they based in one of the hangars? We had um, we had a hangar there. Um, one interesting thing was that they set up a P forty um, up and up in the air, and uh, it was sitting there um, with, so that the undercarriage would work. They had it electrically organised so that you could sit on it and you could operate the undercarriage to get practice in. Um, operating the undercarriage and seeing how the wheels turn round as they did in a kitty hawk. Okay. So um, I guess we could open it up to questions now. Has anybody out there got questions for Rich? I make them too hard. <laughs> um, put your hand up if you have a question. Uh, Luke Herbert, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, was there any radio communication between the pilots and the Kitty Hawks and the Australian troops on the ground? Yeah, we had radio communication at um, uh, uh, Ohakia. Um, actually, the first flight, two, two or three flights we made was in Harvard's to get us used to working on what they called a, an operational um, uh, field uh, because uh, uh, it wasn't so necessary at uh, Woodburn, but uh, with the very different types of aircraft that were likely to come in at Ohakia, uh, they made sure that we could uh, uh, organize properly on the radio, uh, proper call signs, uh, the proper uh, radio terms that we would use. And uh, so we got used to that. There was no trouble, to get, no, no trouble getting used to it. It was such a same nature to us. So uh, the, the question though was when you were up in the islands uh, working with the Australians, were, was there contact with the Australians on the ground with you guys uh, in not, the air? Uh, not with the Australians on the ground, no. No. Um, on the odd occasion, there was an Australian aircraft which would go in and uh, go in with a smoke bomb and show us where to, to bomb. But um, um, we decided that we could do better than that. And uh, our CO, Ralph Court, or our Flight Lieutenant Skip Watson, uh, they would become Smokey Joe. They would go in first with their smoke bomb, um, they'd drop it down, and then they would come back and tell us where to bomb in relation to what to the uh, smoke that was coming. So they'd go back in with their bomb, they would have their bomb too. And, uh, but there was no contact with the Australians on the ground uh, while we were on a strike. Okay. We, knew, we knew what to do. We knew where the Japs were. 
and we knew where the Aussies were. And um, uh, we weren't like the Americans. Um, we had the right people. Right. Any other questions? Put your hand up if you have a question. Uh, yep, Carl Winter. You need to unmute. Yep, hello. Thanks, Hi, Red. Carl. Hello, sir. Nice to meet you. A um, couple of questions, um, starting with uh, how many hours then did you have in the P-40 during the war and um, how many uh, combat sorties? That's the first question, those two questions. Uh, well, uh, I only did 60 hours in Kitty Hawks, 60 hours in, in um, um, Tiger Moss to start off with, and 150 hours in Harvards, and then 60 hours in Kitty Hawks, then 15 hours in a Corsair, and they reckon after 15 hours you could fly a Corsair. Okay. That was all the conversion flight was. After that, uh, after that 15 hours, you were in a squadron and away you went. And then how many, um, how many combat missions did you, do, did you fly in support of the ground troops then? How many? Yes, sir. How many combat missions, he said? Or operations. Do you, do you know how many operations you did in the islands? Oh, 30, 60. Uh, I did two, two tours. Um, I can tell you that. If it gets daylight. Coming here somewhere. Thank you. I take it you're looking at your original log books. Is that what's going on? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm gonna find out. <laughs> oh, it's going over there somewhere in the back. The first tour, I did 34 missions, mm. and the next one I did 65 missions, a total of 99 missions altogether. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That's, a, that's wow. That is amazing. So you mentioned that um, you never saw um, an enemy aircraft in the air. Did you I ever see a big there was no aircraft, enemy aircraft in the air. The only aircraft, enemy aircraft that were hanging around at our time, while we were up at Emerald, there were two uh, Japanese aircraft sneaked away from a bowl and they went to Manus Island where there was a, um, um, a floating dock, I think, that they tried to destroy. They, I think they sneaked there, and I think they sneaked back and got back without um, uh, getting caught. But there was a constant air patrol. Uh, four aircraft were over uh, Rabaul, um all day, from dawn until dusk. And there was very, very little chance the Japanese could, uh, uh, could get airborne. And the same, there was another place called Kavieng on the top of uh, uh, New Ireland. And uh, when we were at MRL, that was where we uh, did most of our uh, flying, and uh, we did a constant air patrol over Kaviang. Uh, they did the Rabol, they did the Rabol from Bougainville, they did it from Green Island, and, uh, and there was a fair bit of water to fly to get there. In the islands, whenever you took off, it was straight over water. and. Uh, when you landed, you landed straight from water. So you didn't want your motor cutting out either as you took off or just as you came into land. Oh, no, one, one chap was supposed to have, um, uh, we never lifted our, uh, folded our wings either. Although only one chap somehow folded his wings as he took off and he went straight in. But I don't know, I don't know who that was. I don't know whether he got out or not. He probably didn't. 
because they were seven ton. Of course they were seven ton. That's a pretty heavy number. I don't know what the kitty all weighed. Uh, Liz might know. But, uh, yeah, Liz, is, Liz is gone now, but. <laughs> Liz, well, th thank you very much, Rich. I have more questions, but I'll let someone else take a few and then maybe I'll get another one later. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Be Bevan Jews, who actually happens to be uh, the world's youngest P-40 pilot, um, he'd like to ask a question. Hi, Ann. Hi, Rich. Um, just a quick one relating back to, you're talking about the radio calls before. So when you were flying on the OTU at Ohakia and you were out flying on your own, what would your radio call or your call sign be would it, um, when you were flying there? Would it be to related to your name or related to the aeroplane or how did you uh, guys do your call signs? Wouldn't, wouldn't be a name. Wouldn't, uh, yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be the aircraft, it would be your name. Okay, that's yep. quite interesting. That's right. Yeah, so, um, bit so of you a long, had... Bit of a long name to, to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So... Um, Actually, I go call Wimp. Well, <laughs> 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 <Little> wimpy Wellington. <laughs> and, and my son gets cold boots. <laughs> yeah, so, um, out of interest, I when I started doing a bit of flying in the Kitty Hawk, I'd been flying one over in Australia. Um, I've only done about five hours or so on one, but um, my preparation to get into that. Um, I probably had a little bit more total time than you did. I think I had about um, probably 1,500 hours or so when I flew a Kitty Hawk, but um, I only had about 15 hours in the Harvard, which I did that about or over the two weeks leading up to flying the Kitty Hawk. Um, and I definitely found that on the takeoff, it was a, um, a bit more of a, a noisy, experience than, than than the Harvard it was like yeah, it was a um, bit of an eye-opener the first time but yeah it's a lot of fun. I'll tell you what we did and um, uh, somebody used to, used to say that um, uh, landing a P-40 was like uh, landing a Harvard flapless so we started using coming in in a Harvard with no flaps so we could get up somewhere near the speed of a a kitty hawk coming in the land. I don't yeah. know whether it's good or not. That sounds sounds like quite a quite a good thing to do. Normally, um, you now before you fly P forty or any of the fighters, they get you to fly the Harvard from the back seat, so you get oh. used to flying it without um, being able to see out the front. I know, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I I didn't. Um, I had done that like oh, several years ago, but. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the Harvard went unserviceable the day that I was going to fly the P-40 to do that backseat check. So, um, yeah, I, I just went straight into the P-40. But that's an amazing aeroplane. Yeah. And you can... Of course, yeah. I mean, the engine was 14 feet in front of you. Yeah, that's... that's... And, uh, a lot of people, a lot of Americans didn't like it because of length. But if you uh, did a curved approach... Coming into land, you got down all right. Mm, yeah. oh. I sat in the course there that we've got and mastered in quite a lot, and you definitely get a big appreciation for how long that nose is. The propeller looks like it's so far away. Right, yeah. A lot of people reckon the best way to land was to just lift your flaps. Last, the last six feet, lift your flaps. Well, yeah. It's certainly not going to fly again. <laughs> you stop down then. Mm. Oh, very good. Thank you. That's all right. Uh, so, have we got any other questions for Rich? Yeah, uh, Dave, it's Des here. Uh, sorry, uh, Rich, I haven't got the video link uh, today, but I've got uh, audio, which is really good. Rich, um, I was an um, air ordnance man on Five Squadron uh, for seven and a half years, and I'm just interested in the ordnance side of things. Um, with your training at OTU uh, at Ahakia, did you do quite a bit of... Um, weapons training uh, during your time there? Um, we did um, quite a bit of um, um, air-to-ground gunnery 
and air-to-air -air gun gunnery about the last, uh, we were there two, two months, and about the last um, three weeks, I suppose, it was pretty well all air-to-air uh, -air gunnery and uh, air-to-ground gunnery. Okay, and did that uh, put you in good stead when you got to the South Pacific Islands into the operational area? Yeah, yeah. Um, all, all our flights, um, <laughs> we, we would go out with a bomb, anything from a, a 325 pound up to a thousand pound, depending yep. on, on the target. Um, we had um, um, a th about a three foot length of pipe sticking out in front of the bomb. Yep. And uh, that, that would hit and explode and scatter above the ground. So right. that didn't sink in. Right. Oh, thanks for that uh, insight, uh, Reg. Just a small part on the, uh, the weapons uh, side of things yep. uh, for you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I think I saw a hand from Cutting Edge. Uh, I'm not sure. Yep, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, all right. can you guys see me okay? Yes, yep. Yeah, yeah Reg, I was just wondering um, in all your, your sorties if um, you have any kind of missions in particular that you remember, um, you know, or were you ever hit by ground fire or anything of the like? No, no I wasn't. Um, nothing ever happened to me. Uh, it always happened to the bloke that flew the plane afterwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, um, we had um, one occasion when um, uh, we used to have a Dumbo. Dumbo would go out with a strike, and there would always be two aircraft go out um, to look after the Dumbo. And uh, the Dumbo would go first, and then he would usually sit down if the sea was smooth. He would sit down on it quite a distance away and wait until the strike was over. Uh, in case you had to pick anybody up. And oh, yeah. on one occasion, uh, there were two people um, were uh, escorting him, and one of them must have got a bit too close to the Japs because he got hit. Oh, no. Round fire, and he had the ditch and came home in the Dumbo. <laughs> wow. So, uh, um, and uh, he, he, he uh, finished up trot dressing in uh, for Guy Robertson after the war. So for people who don't know, the Dumbo was the Catalina flying boat, which... Uh, Catalina, yeah. Yeah, for air uh, sea rescue. There was another, another one, um, Miles King from New Plumber, um, who started rural aviation. Uh, he was in our squadron. And um, we were on a strike down the south of Bougainville and uh, he got ground fire and he managed to get out um, just away from the coast. I went to put his um, aircraft down, managed to get out and um, uh, he swam ashore and uh, he was picked up by the Australians and they returned him home uh, the next day. And uh, I've been here talking for a long time about um, uh, trying to get a new watch or something like that. And uh, uh, he uh, managed to get one. Uh, whether he got out of the Air Force or what, I don't know. But um, uh, he got back from the uh, from his uh, um, aircraft loss. He had to put in a, a full recoup report. And uh, uh, I don't know whether uh, Snow Bennett did anything when he got picked up by the Dumbo, but I know Miles King put in a full report uh, when he was uh, shot down and ditched off Bougainville. Mm. Right. Well, thank you, but, Rich. We've got another question from our other uh, P-40 and Corsair uh, veteran, and that's Alan Emmett. So, Alan, you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, just wondering what uh, squadron uh, he was in. I was in 22. 22? Yeah. You were, when, when, when were you at MRL? What's that? When were you at MRL? When was I at MRL? I was there in, uh, uh, after Christmas 44. Oh, yeah. you must have been, you, 
<laughs> you must have gone in there after I was. I, I was the first New Zealand squadron in there. I um, was with, with 19 squadron. Went, uh, first, uh, first squadron in Amaral. I think you were there before me. Yeah. Um, if you were there just after Christmas, like we left just before, just after Christmas, we came home. Uh, well, if you we, went in, you 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 took over from us. We were at Santos for Christmas. I've still got the uh, Christmas menu for Santos. Oh, yeah. and, <laughs> uh, then we went on to Emerald, and I think yeah. we had to share tents with you blokes for the first night because you couldn't fly out. You couldn't fly out that night. Probably could. Yes, you probably did. Yeah, we, I, right. I was I, I was in the first squadron that went in there. Were you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the aircraft that I flew on Bougainville was five yeah. three nine. Now that was in on Santos. You would have flown yeah. F or forty seven, um, which were two. There's quite a few photos around of line of aircraft on Santos. Uh, yeah. And they come up with 31 SU to Bougainville. And yeah. uh, on my second tour, I shared that with a chappy in A flight. Um, we each flew it whenever we were flying. And uh, it yeah. broke a hair and got smashed up. Smashed up, yeah. That's yeah. right. And yeah. never, let me, never let me down. No. We didn't do much flying at the Morial. Very, very little flying. You just the uh, patrols for the, about eighty or after a day. Yeah. So we only flew about only flew about tw twice a week. Yeah. Were you I, like, like that when you were there? No, we we flew. Um, the, the, um, I flew about half the number that I flew in the second one. Uh, we were flying over Kaviang, yeah. uh, dawn to dusk patrols over Kaviang mainly. That's I think right. the odd one to Raval, but uh, mainly mainly um, Kaviang. And of course, Amaral was where um, those fleet air arm pilots um, that got dumped um, after the uh, their ship was sunk by the uh, Germans. They yeah. were dumped there. Uh, and released on condition that they took no active part in the war. But that didn't stop them being instructors. And, <laughs> and flying officer Andy Miller was my instructor on Harvard's. Oh, yeah. Well, how old are you? If that's 96. not a real question. <laughs> 96. 96. What about you? I'm just, um, I was 95 last April. Oh, yeah. yeah I, 96 and a half. <laughs> 96 and a half, yeah. Well, I, I was the young, I was the youngest in the squadron, <laughs> and I'm the only one left in the squad out of 22. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was originally in 17, yeah. uh, and, uh, but 22 needed two pilots to leave a week before 17, and they yeah. grabbed me. And another bloke, and uh, we finished up in 22, and we stayed with yeah. 22, and yeah. then at the end well, of 26 uh, was demobbed first, and uh, yeah, that, that, that was that, that was my squad in 26. Our CO, that was my squad in 26. Our, our CO Ralph Court decided that he was going over to New Guinea or somewhere, so he uh, gave up our squadron. And uh, Bill Dells from 26, uh, he came in with half his crew and they took over 22 squadron. We only yeah. did three flights and they went and dropped the bombs. That was the end of it. Yeah. So we were at home. We, we, we were home on leave when the war ended in 26 squadron. Yeah. And we were due about a week away from going back again for my third tour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, like, and they cancelled it, demobbed yeah. I didn't. I didn't get the way for my third tour. And yeah, no, no, no. no I, I missed. 
we're all, all set to go, but uh, another week and we would have gone. Oh. Yeah. Right. Fascinating uh, stuff, guys. Nice to talk anyway. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> right have you got any um, particular P40 memories, Alan, that you want to just throw in here about the P40? Well, I've got a, a number here, uh, Dave. 3270, the P40, that I flew down in uh, Harkia. I only flew it twice, both on the same day, and it must have been the second flight. When I came into land, I was just patting myself on the back about the best landing I'd ever made on the P40, and the left wing started to drop down. The undercarriage was not folding up. Pulled me around in a circle, off, off the runway, onto the grass, facing back the wrong way I came from, and that was that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm just wondering whatever happened to that plane. That was a P40. That was a P40, yeah. P40N. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. 3270. Yeah, I've got a list here with all the names. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's one of the ones that ended at uh, Rooker here, is it? Was it on, on that list? Yeah. Yep. I, uh, no, and that's on the, uh, uh, on the list of all the aircraft that came to New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. So are there any other questions out there for either two gentlemen? Uh, Today, going back to uh, the P-40 yep. and Frank saying about firing the guns, there was one thing he didn't mention, in fact, when he fired the guns, the aircraft almost come to a standstill. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. He had to hit the button, finger on the button for too long. The aircraft would slow right down. Because I remember when we, the first time I fired them, there was uh, three of us in formation, I think, in a V formation in the, with the instructor in the middle. He said, right, fire your guns now. And one of us must have been too late or too, I don't know, but the, the formation just, just disintegrated. Wow. Interesting. And I think if I, I think if, looking back, I think if I fired the guns at a very low speed, it could have stalled the plane. Wow. <laughs> Baz, you've got a question? Yeah, um, it's something you brought up before, Dave, um, about how the P-40, the early P-40s were kitty hawks and the later ones, the ends, were called war hawks. I was just wondering about two veterans. Did you call them all kitty hawks or did you call them as P-40s? Yeah, kitty hawks. I call them all kitty hawks. Yeah. They were all the kitty hawks. The war hawk, I think, it was an English name, wasn't it? I think it was American, was it Dave? Yeah, I think the, the Americans called them Warhawks. But it's interesting, in, in the paperwork, they're often, the, the later two models, the M and the N, are referred to as the Warhawk. Um, oh, no. Yeah, um, but because, like it's interesting, it's like a colloquialism, everybody called them Kitty Hawks in New Zealand. Oh. Um, yeah, interesting. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for that. Any other questions out there? Brenton? You have to unmute. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I was talking to my dad, I guess. Um <laughs> mention anything about the night flying. He um he has a bit to say about that. I jog his memory. And also flying in the wet. Well, I, I don't remember what you're talking about, Brent. The sparks coming out the... the oh, the sparks coming out of the air at night flying. Every time you moved the throttle, the shower of sparks came out of the exhaust back in the side of the cockpit. Hmm. Uh, 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 <coughs> and I also remember you telling me that um, when you're flying the Kelly Hawk, if you're Oh, yeah. Like, in, in the rain. You got wet because the cockpits weren't waterproof. 
Vi <laughs> får det. Vad är det? Vad har den fan där? Vad den har den nu? Har den nu tören kris? Nej. Han har tören kris, men inte mig. That's uh, yeah, that's not a good thing when you base it on hockey because it seems to be always raining at a hockey. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any last, last, any last questions here for the gentleman? We will need to move on soon. Um, I'm not seeing any hands. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much to our two veterans. It's, uh, it's fantastic to hear from you both and, and uh, you know, stick around. We might have some more questions for you at the end, but uh, um, we'll move on to our next speaker now, which is David Duxbury. Uh, he's going to give us a bit of a talk on uh, the history of number 15 squadron, um, who were the first RNZF P-40 squadron to go into the Pacific. Over to David. Right. Okay. Am I coming on clearly? Yep. yep you're oh, good. good. Yes. Well, Dave asked me uh, to speak on 15, uh, probably because I told him a little bit about it, because I had interviewed several of the pilots that were on the first tour, which was in uh, 1943. And also, um, the certain amount of, um, well, 15 felt a little bit left out because they missed out on a lot of things that 14 squadrons seemed to get, and that was particularly publicity. Because when uh, 15 squadron was at Guadalcanal on their very first tour in April 43, or end of, uh, end of April, last yeah, and they, went, they were there from about the last day of April right through to May and into the middle of June. And they never had any, there's no official photographers floating around, so there's no pictures of them up there at all. Not in Tonga, not in, not in Espirito Santo, not in Nandi, Fiji, where they spent a wee bit of time, and not at, certainly not at Guadalcanal. The only photographs, in fact, that were taken of them were there when they arrived back at in New Zealand after their first tour, and they were pretty bedraggled. And they, they got photographed, I think it was by the Weekly News. And of course, the, the picture appeared in the next issue. And the people in Wellington thought they were an absolute disgrace. They were sort of scruffy and bedraggled and looked like, you know, drowned rats that had arrived back after a hard tour. And they, they felt quite hurt by that, <laughs> not surprisingly. And, 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 and they missed out all the publicity because Leo White, the photographer, was up, up in, in the islands and about to... Oh, July, June, July 43, and he took pictures of all the squadrons on operation then. He took the Hudson people and the Catalinas and the Kitty Hawk squadrons, both at Santo and at Guadalcanal. So heaps of photographs are still in the archives. All the negatives are still there. But 15 missed out on all of that. In fact, the only photographs that were the early ones with publicity shots were taken in, in Fanuapai, which is where 15 squadron was formed in 1st of June, 1942. There's quite a nice spread of them in the weekly news quite late in the year, just uh, shortly before they went overseas. So as I said, they, they always felt a bit, um, a bit of, not shame, but um, they missed out on something through lack of publicity. And I was told that right to the end. They always just annoyed that they, they hadn't got good pictures of them up there. And that wasn't their only grumble. Um, because they were formed, of course, 15 was one of the three Kitty Hawk squadrons they formed in the um, first half of 1942 in New Zealand. Of course, these aircraft were shipped out brand new from the United States um, and assembled at, uh, these are E-models, of course, they were assembled at both at Hobsonville, where I think about I think about 24 of them or something were assembled, and the rest were assembled at Harewood which surprises a lot of people. In fact, they assembled some Hudsons at Harewood too. And um, the reason for that was that they were quite afraid that the Japanese would have, if there were any carrier attacks, they um, they would have hit the main main ports, of course, and that would be Auckland and, and Wellington. And they, they thought Christchurch might be a bit safer. But they only ever did the, uh, I think only, I think they sent two shipments into Littleton. I think they're about, you know, 18 Kitty Hawks assembled there. 
So anyway, they formed up these squadrons. Um, they're all brand new squadrons, although, well, I say that, but in fact, 488 Squadron, which was our first fighter squadron that was formed up in New Zealand in September 41, and was sent to Singapore, and they had a hard time up there, of course, and when they came back, um, the, the, of course, 488 was a, a number given to them by the Royal Air Force. It was a, a, what they call an Article 15 squadron, which meant that they were to represent New Zealand, but flying under RAF administration. Usually, like all the Article 15 squadrons in Britain, they, they, um, they got the publicity for it, but in many cases, the squadrons might have only had a few New Zealanders in them at certain stages. Yeah, anyway, uh, when 15, uh, sorry, 48, 488 got back and was formed, reformed at uh, Masterton, um, the Royal Air Force says, well, what do you want to do with them? And they, uh, and the Wellingtons told them that they were going to hold them in New Zealand for local defence. And they said, oh, well, we'll have our number back, thanks very much, you don't need it. <laughs> and um, and that, they were renumbered 14 Squadron. But uh, not all their ground staff, in fact, went went to, uh, stayed with 14. Uh, quite a few of them ended up with 15 squadron when that was formed up at the beginning of June. And the, of course, we were supposed to get 80 kitty hawks in 1942, but um, things changed and priorities changed. And the British said, well, because these were, for, these were aircraft from British allocations, they had all British markings when we got them, fully like the ones that, in fact, like the ones that some of the American ones held back for their own uh, squadrons. And um, where was I? Um, yeah, so anyway, only 44 E models came into New Zealand in 1942, and they, they, they wanted to form three squadrons. And of course, most people think of a squadron as, ooh, you know, about 20 aircraft maybe, but um, Anyway, they decided to have 12, uh, 12 Kitty Hawks and six Harvards per squadron. And they, you know, they were based at, uh, as they formed them, it, it, the first one was Masterton, the second one, 15, was at Nuapai. And of course, that was a, a, a station in a state of great, uh, great disruption at that time too, because they were trying to build all the big runways at that stage. And they only had one runway left for them. And that was pretty rough. That's when they were installing the big uh, octagon, was it octagonal, hexagonal blocks for the runways, quite big, massive things. And um, so it was quite quite dangerous at times operating off there, because of course, Fenorpa and, and the Haki, when they were built, they were just grassy fields. That was, you know, just before the war. So they had to be, the Americans requested them to have, you know, the big hard runways for their heavy aircraft uh, when they figure that they might have to be ferrying large numbers of heavy aircraft down through the South Pacific to reach the um, Australia and back up to the Philippines, which of course, uh, and in, in the end, they, they were never forced that far south. They mostly went through north of us. So we had the airfields to ourselves, fortunately. Anyway, when they formed up 15, they had quite a few, yeah, m most of the pilots were new, new chaps, brand new, straight off um, training schools. But they had, uh, when they were, were uh, realising they'd have to form these fighter squadrons in New Zealand. Of course, we had we didn't have any fighter pilots here. Didn't have any manuals to tell you how to fight in fighters. And they called on the Royal Air Force to send back some some of the more experienced New Zealand pilots that had been with fighter command earlier in the war to become the commanding officers and, and flight commanders for the squadrons to give them a bit of well some real experience and and administrative abilities and. And the rest of the squadron, the rest of the pilots were made up from instructors who volunteered for operational duties. There were quite a few instructors in the early squadrons, fighter squadrons, people like Harry Wigley and a uh, whole, whole crowd of them. Um, so they had these three squadrons anyway set up, uh, as I said, at, uh, at Masterton, Vanuapai, and the third one was formed up at Ahakia, but moved almost immediately to Woodburn, where they were housed in the, what they called the, oh, what was the camp? I've forgotten what the camp was. What was it called? Which one was that? The one at Woodburn. Uh, you know the one I mean? Fairhall. Fairhall, of course it is. Yeah, it's named yeah. after the farm next next door. Yeah. That's right. So they had the three squadrons. And of course, they were strategically located there for um, the defence of the main harbours and the shipping, what they call focal areas, where the ships would tend to congregate before either departing or arriving. 
you know, if you're out in the open oceans, it's very difficult to find a ship in a huge ocean. But if, if you hang around the focal areas, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, be spoiled for choice if you're a, a, a U-boat commander. And uh, although they were more worried about the Japanese in 1942, of course, in fact, the Germans never worried as much, except um, well, when the raiders were around earlier in the war, where the, um, that's where the Emerald people, um, they were mentioned uh, earlier by somebody telling us about them, that the, well, the, the, the people on the Rangitani, I think it was, that ended up at Emerald. Anyway, that's, that's enough of that. Uh, so later in 42, um, the Americans said, well, we've got these Kitty Hawk squadrons there doing nothing at home. Um, we still need, you know, fighters in the Ford area. How about sending them up? And they, well, they asked, in fact, for a Hudson squadron to start with, and that was dispatched. And then they wanted a Kitty Hawk squadron, and they wanted that placed in Tonga, Tonga Tabu, I think they called it, at the airfield that they, uh, who built that? I think New Zealand built that field. Americans, I think, improved it. And... 50, as I said, 15 squadron was chosen to be the, the one to go up there. And they said, well, you don't have to take any aircraft. Um, we've got a whole stack of them here waiting for you. And New Zealand, oh, that's, you know, I thought, that's good. That's one least thing we have to worry about. So they sent, put them uh, on a ship called the USS President Jackson in Wellington. And away they went. And about, ooh, I don't know, 10 days later, they arrived up at, in Tonga. And here they were taken out to this. Well, they found it was pretty rough up there, actually. There was only a single long jetty, and they, um, and they, of course, they'd taken all their own transport and trucks and things. Most of their most of their transport vehicles were old English models, which they found were not too hot in the in the tropics. Uh, mainly because they weren't strong enough for the terrible terrible roads in Tonga. They're absolutely awful. And in fact, they tried to get to American four-wheel drive, but um, they had lots of other problems when they got there. Well, the first problems they had were the condition of the aircraft that the Americans had left. They had 23 P-40s, all of them E's. Funnily enough, they were pretty much from the same batch that the aircraft we had in New Zealand. They were all sort of brothers and sisters. They were that close. Plus, they had two brand new model Ks. Um, but these were the short fuselage Ks with the ugly tail. And they'd only just, I think they'd only been in Tonga about a month. And, but the condition of them was very poor, which I always found amazing, because they had a, Americans had a, quite a extensive um, maintenance organisation up there, and they had radar stations up there. Huge amounts of uh, supplies and tons of ammunition and bombs of all sorts and depth charges. And... Uh, the engineer office was quite appalled at the state of these aircraft and they, 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 they're all declared unserviceable and they had to keep working on them. Eventually, I think in about three weeks, they had 90% of them in airworthy condition. I, I, I can't imagine how they got in such a bad state because, Amer as I said, the Americans had plenty of resources there. Anyway, the first shock they got was that the Americans said, oh, well, your main duty will be anti-submarine operations. Yes, they found rather hard to believe, anti-submarine, and oh yes, you know, they're the main threat here. They were, you know, a bit removed from the main battlefront, which is sort of much further west, and a wee bit north of them. In fact, it was actually, even then, it was a backwater of the war, which they soon realised, and, and in fact, the duty they were doing, the Americans call it garrison duty, you know, it was a garrison, it had to be manned and, and, and ready for battle, but they weren't ex actually expected to really come up against anything much in the near future. So they got down to the job of, of becoming um, patrol patrol bomber pilots, but unfortunately they they had no bomb racks and this was a bit disturbing, but they, the Americans said they were, they were trying to get some get bomb racks. The stupid thing was they had so many bombs, but no bomb racks. I think the bombs were there too for American aircraft, but I think yeah, at that stage, yeah, aircraft were the only ones on the field. On the airfield was a far uh, motu, I think it was called. I think it's still there. And they they had a, the Americans had built a, a compass rose and everything for them. And they, as I said, the technical people had to get on the job. Oh, incidentally, the um, technical staff at 15 were quite interesting too. They had a, a little batch of Royal Air Force um, NCOs and airmen. 16 of them they were. Uh, plus they had a warrant officer. RF warrant officer, who was the engineer warrant officer, but for some mysterious reason, he was sent back to New Zealand. And 
And they also mentioned that the, <laughs> there's some quite interesting files survived which give a report on the on these RE femur. And they said, well, they said they're quite good technical chaps actually, but they they mainly seem to hold a grudge against the Royal New Zealand Air Force for kidnapping them in the first place, because these people had been in, in Singapore when that was um, put under pressure by the Japanese. And of course, they're all forced out in great confusion and ended up all over the place, including New Zealand. These ones just happened to get on a ship that came down to New Zealand. And I think the Royal Air Force said, oh, we'll make use of them while you can and you know, send them back when you don't want them. And they, yeah, they seem to, some of them are quite, yeah, quite bitter about being down here, way, you know, far from home. They thought they were going to go back to the UK. They'd already had a hard time. But they, I think they settled down and, um, you know, I just thought it was funny that they had this little clique of disgruntled um, chaps from the British Isles working under, du under duress <laughs> without a lot. But they, um, anyway, the, all the aircraft got going and they put up, they're putting up about, I think they're putting up about ooh, 30 hours a, a month, I suppose, each pilot, that sort of figure in, in the aircraft. As I said, there were more, they, in fact, at that stage, they had more aircraft than pilots. Uh, you know, it was about 23 at the start and they only had about 18 pilots when they got there, but I th they did send up extra ones. And then two pilots had to be sent home because they'd, uh, according to the report, that they their eyes had, how do they put it? Their eyes had given out, which would be quite dramatic for a, a pilot. <laughs> Whether they'd managed to scrape through um, eye tests by some sort of cheating, which you, you occasionally hear about, I don't know, but they, there was, they never came back into the Ford area, those two. And uh, there, was, there was also some of the airmen, uh, not the RF ones, but the other airmen that were sent back with psych psychiatric problems. Uh, they said they'd sent them up. They thought they might come right being in an operational unit, but it didn't work out. But these comings and goings are quite normal. If you read in, in detail through uh, wartime reports, there's all sorts of people coming and going for various reasons. Anyway, so they were here. They were flying around in these, on, trying to fly anti-submarine patrols and Kitty Hawks. They were at a uh, normal, normal distance out from the coast of around Tonga, was 35 miles out to sea, and sometimes up to 60 miles if they were intercepting ships that might have needed. Um, and they weren't very keen on that, particularly as the um, when they arrived there, they weren't very happy with the safety equipment that the Americans had in the aircraft. Like they didn't have um, little little. Um, one man dinghies that the Royal Air Force uh, had introduced uh, earlier in the war. They just had their May Wests and the May Wests were American types, which they didn't like. And the parachute harnesses were the American type too, which didn't have a quick release on them. And they knew that the Americans had lost three pilots uh, uh, in the middle of 1942. You know, the Americans had been there since May 42 up in Tonga. Three, pi uh, three aircraft were lost in a period of two months. And then one one of them actually spun into the just spun into the jungle. He, he he got out of control, doing some exercises too low, and he was killed. And there were two lost at sea. One was had an engine failure and ditched. Another one tried to bail out of an aircraft after an engine failure, and uh, he he was never found again. So that was well, they, well the Americans said it was probably because of the the one that parachuted. He he probably got pulled down by a chute because he didn't have a quick release. And if you don't, if you know, it was quite common. Uh, early in the war with the Americans losing airmen at sea because they couldn't get their parachute harnesses off or they were trapped under the canopy and just dragged down. So they were, uh, because we were more used, to, particularly as the flight commanders and 15 squadron were both experienced RAF pilots, they were New Zealanders, uh, they made sure that they got proper uh, May, proper English RAF May Wests and they wanted the English one man dinghies and there was, what else was wrong with them? The various problems with a lot of the equipment in the aircraft, um, something to do with the, the the types of masks they used. Uh, they didn't like the American masks and the gun sights they hated. <laughs> they just hated them. They wanted and they wanted. They called to Wellington. They said, "Send us up uh, enough sights. You know, we want 26 sights for the aircraft, or 25, or however many it was." And they said, "Sorry, we've only got 40 in the whole country, and you've already got the sights. We're going to keep them." And so they had to fly with the original American gun sights. Um, you know, they, they were a um, reflector sight, but they went, because the particular pilots that had served in Britain 
uh, that was on the squad, and they said, no, they're not as, they're not nearly as good as the RAF ones, but they, but they had to tolerate them for the meantime. And there was all sorts of, then they, were, they complained about their typewriter. It was, it was a portable typewriter, and it was just about had it. And they, they reckon they needed six typewriters to catch up with all their correspondence and reports and forms and things. So there's all these little tragedies going on all the time. Uh, and But they the good thing was they did get on with the Americans better than they thought they would. They also learned that the Americans administration was horrendous. Where the RAF would have, say, six copies of each form, the Americans would want 12. And this, this is when they only had the one typewriter. So they were in, in severe trouble. Anyway, they seemed a long way from the war there. Nothing ever came near them. There was no submarines. They, they knew the war was happening, you know, 500, 600 miles away. And anyway, in February 42, they got the word, uh, 43, sorry, 43, they got the word. They were to move to the operational area. <gasps> well, this is what they've been waiting for. And in February, they, I won't give dates. I'm relying on memory here, but it was February 43. They were ordered to move the, all the aircraft surviving ones had already, in fact, they'd already lost uh, a pilot, a uh, young pilot called Sergeant Crystal, who, like the American aircraft, American pilot in the year before, he'd spun in his P-40 into the jungle, and he was killed. Uh, low flying. Um, and they'd also, the, one of the flight commanders had written off one of the brand new P-40Ks, it was their only drogue aircraft. They, they, they didn't have any aircraft to tow, tow drogues. There were no drogue things there for them, but they, um, they received one with these, one of the P-40Ks, and he was doing a takeoff. And what did he do now? He did something, he forgot something. Uh, I can't remember what it was now, but anyway, he lost control on takeoff and destroyed that aircraft. He wasn't hurt, so that was one of the Ks gone. So they were down to, well, it was two gone. I think they wrote another one off. Anyway, I think they had about 19 or 20 that they could um, send to, off to Espirito Santo. That was quite near the Ford area. And of course, the big American, that was a big American rear base. You know, it was all sorts of activity there. The aircraft carriers parked there, the huge stores depots or big repair depots being built. A lot of aircraft squadrons being trained up to operational peaks and uh, ships from, you know, here to, uh, to Christmas. Very busy, very much, you know, Tonga was just a little remote thing away out in the wilderness compared to Espirito Santo, which is, of course, part of Vanuatu, what's called Vanuatu now. So they very, the, in fact, these were the first long-range ferry flights made by RNZF fighters in the Pacific. Um, 14 Squadron came somewhat later when they brought the Ks up from, the Nemes up from New Zealand. But these were the e, original E models. And they went hoppity, hoppity, hop up to Santo. Uh, I think it was about three hops, I think. And they started working there with, uh, that's right, they were sent there for local defence because I think the Japanese had started sending down bombers at night, Betty's and flying boats used to come down at night and sneak around the place and make a nuisance of themselves, sometimes dropping bombs. And of course they then expected, um, well that's right, they had, that was the interest, another interesting thing, they started night flying because fighter pilots, day fight, uh, you know, single seater fighter pilots don't normally do much night flying. They you know, they train and they're training they do night flying, but anyway, they had to get up to scratch on night flying when they were in Tonga. And oh, is, is somebody keeping time? Uh, I might don't want to overrun my um, you there, Dave? Yep, yep. sorry, I was mu muted. Um, yeah, no, you, I just good. wondered how long I've, have, I, have I used up half my time or three quarters of it? About, about half, I think. Okay, I'll <laughs> keep tearing on. Yeah. I hope to throw in a few jokes soon. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> yeah, so they anyway they started exercising there, and, and uh, but they weren't there very long, and then they got another order. The Americans thought that they were, their tactics were all back, uh, obsolete. They had, in fact, these RAF chaps that had come out, they were New Zealanders, like people like Mike Herrick, for instance. In fact, he had become uh, he became the commanding officer shortly after this. But he was funny enough, he, he had been a night fighter pilot in the Battle of Britain, or just after, or in the Blitz flying <coughs> Blenheims. You know, a lot of people forget that the Blenheim was also a night fighter. And he, I think he'd shot down several Germans. But anyway, he um, led one of the, what, the first flight of P-40s on this trip up to Santo. But as I said, once they'd been there a while, they, they sent them on down to, to Fiji because there was an American carrier who had arrived there and they had a carrier air group on board of, you know, 
dauntlesses and help, uh, wildcats and so forth. And um, they wanted the New Zealanders to practice modern tactics. Yeah, the mentioned, reason I mentioned Herrick was that um, these RAF chaps, despite the fact they arrived in New Zealand in the middle of 42, were still flying the old um, three aircraft VICs. That was their combat formation. You know, the Germans, as you know, had, had been using the four four aircraft formation, you know, tactical formation right from the beginning of the war. I think they learned it in Spain. Anyway, the Americans had already picked up on this and they told us to take, adopt these modern tactics and also to operate with American carrier air groups to get up to date with American tactics and formations and procedures and so forth. And anyway, whilst this was underway, they're quite busy, they were flying with just about every day they could with the American, you know, the Americans sending up quite big formations and they would fly escorts and it was all practice. And then they lost their commanding officer in a horrific crash when he flew straight into a dauntless. Um, and they both spiraled in, there were three men killed during a, an ex this exercise. And that was quite a shock to them. But I, I've heard it said, uh, it sounds terrible, but um, I've heard it from quite a few of the pilots in that squad, and they said, well, it was possibly the best thing that could have happened to them. Because they knew, um, I won't mention his name, but he was quite, a, he was a well liked chap. He'd been a pre war, uh, as commercial pilot with Cox Strait Airways flying the uh, rapides on the Cox Strait runs. But they said he was, he was a, a typical commercial pilot. He, he took pride in his flying, he was, all his flying was beautiful. But they knew that that's the sort of flying will get you killed in, uh, in operations, particularly on fighters, where you have to fly rough as guts. You you should be slamming your control stick in any corner at any time to fall, you know, to get the enemy off your tail. And um, I was told, you know, several of the young type pilots told me too. They said, yeah, he was he was pr too proud of his flying. And um, and anyway, Herrick was promoted to squadron leader in this place, and he he led them up to. Guadalcanal when they went that, that far north. So then they, uh, from Fiji, they went back up to Santo in uh, late, late March, I think it was, and they did a little bit of more flying there. And then, it, then they got the word they were going to go up to the front line. And of course, the front line, and uh, this was the end of April 43, was Guadalcanal, because that had been t invaded by the Americans way back in August 42. But the Japanese put up very fierce resistance for quite a long time. There were some huge battles. It was a real hell, hell hole there around Guadalcanal for quite some long number of months. And, you know, battleships were sunk and aircraft carriers were sunk and hundreds of thousands of troops were killed and pretty horrific time at Guadalcanal and areas around it. Ships, aircraft, day, night, anything could happen. So, um, Arrived at Guadalcanal and um, they could smell it was different up there. And hello, what's happened? Oh, lost my picture. Never mind. Can you st can you still see me, Dave? Oh. Can you hear me, Dave? Yep, yep, yep. You know you're good. You're, you're oh, okay, David. Someone, someone just hit the sharing, so I've, I've... Oh, oh, that way, yeah, something, something, yeah, I just lost the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. it's all good now. Yep, so they um, went into direction at Guadalcanal, and it, it's, because uh, the field they used up there was one called Kukum Strip, uh, or Fighter 2, and it was right, right by the beach, and on this field were based several U.S. Army Air Forces fighter squadrons. I think they had P-70s there, that was the Douglas... Havoc night fighter, the big twin engine aircraft, which was not very successful. They had P-38 Lightning Squadron there, and I think they had P-40 F Squadron with the Merlin engine. Uh, I think that was the 44th Fighter Squadron of Army Air Forces, and uh, I think there was some, one other squadron there too. But anyway, it was the main squadron for the Army Air Forces, plus the uh, fighters, plus uh, the New Zealand fighters. And of course, we only had the one squadron then. And uh, they were put straight to work, and most just about all their, I'd say 90% of their flying from from Cactus, or Cactus was the trade name for, uh, code name for the Guadalcanal generally, still we often hear, in fact I heard it mentioned on this forum just a bit earlier uh, this afternoon, somebody mentioned Cactus. Yep. Uh, the main job for them was 
air defence, local air defence, which is the job they did in New Zealand, of course. And um, this thing just involved four or eight aircraft going up as a patrol. They were standing patrols, basically. They'd, they'd fly over anchorages of allied ships or task forces. It was very, very incident. There was a lot of, lot of activity going on in the area at the time. They were building up their forces for their move forward into the central Solomon Islands, which was the area all around uh, New Georgia, and Columbangara, and Rendover, and, and islands like that. There was, and of course, there was a big Japanese airfield was being built right in the middle of it, called Munda, which was quite a famous field, although the Japanese hardly ever got to use it. In fact, there was in, in, in August, the Americans actually um, had a big landing there with, and put the army in, and they horrendous battle they had. They had a terrible time, but they finally kicked the Japanese out and. Ooh. Actually, they landed on the 30th of June. It didn't kick them out till late August, I think. That was a real hellhole there for the army. Um, but we, our aircraft were up guarding the sh the convoy, shipping convoys moving backwards and forwards and the air base itself, because the Japanese still had quite a powerful air force in the area, mostly based up at Rabaul, the only place I've been to uh, up in the Pacific. Funny enough, I haven't been to any of the other Allied air bases, just, just the Japanese headquarters. <laughs> wasn't headquarters when I was there, of course. And um, so these these patrols, they'd have four or eight aircraft to be up at a time, often just four aircraft, often at dawn and dusk. Although, strangely enough, we have got the uh, a full uh, history of the squadron on this tour. It gives every operation, but unfortunately it was uh, sort of done, it was done officially, but they had no proper forms to fill out, so they... Ralph Court, who I never met, but he correspond, I corresponded with him. He was the flight command by this time. And he kept the records of their flying hours in a, in a school exercise book. And he kept this all through and he, he sent me, um, he said he'd send me this book, but then he decided to rewrite it, which I was a bit worried about because if anybody rewrites a co quite a complex book like a, this book with all sorts of details on it, there's bound to be a few little errors in it. And I initially just Earlier today, I found the, f the first errors in it. They, the, something didn't match up. Never mind, he did a... I think his book's probably... I don't know where his, that book's got to. But there is a continuous record of the squadron's operations. And it was all this patrolling. It was just patrolling, patrolling, patrolling. They hardly ever saw anything, for, mo for the most part. But uh, there were a few hi dramatic highlights cropped up. Uh, sometimes they were sent uh, as escorts. Uh, for American bombers, usually the um, Navy type, you know, SPD, Dauntlesses and TBF Avengers doing strikes in the in the Central Solomons. And they, uh, most, most times they didn't see any Japanese, but they were, they knew they were around. And then in, uh, I, I can't remember the dates, but I remember the uh, events. And, uh, and about, about this time, uh, the Americans decided to um, lay some big minefields and likely places where they might catch Japanese ships tearing around, which they were very prone to do. Because of course the Japanese were quite famous in the Solomons with their Tokyo Express, which the, which comprised, well, when they were supplying Guadalcanal, they had uh, convoys up to 20 destroyers going flat out through the night, streaking down from uh, southern Bougainville and down to Guadalcanal, which was under American occupation, but the Jap army was still there fighting. And they'd throw off, off all this, all these supplies to the to float ashore. Americans captured a lot of them, but they um, these destroyers were still around and they still used them, and um, so it could still get very exciting. Anyway, these this this um, minefield the Americans laid it was actually laid by surface ships in a narrow channel that they knew the Japanese used had been using a bit recently, and I think that very night they. Um, Four destroyers came tearing through this. It was called Fuga, the Ferguson Passage, just south of it was somewhere in the central Solomons. And uh, when they ran into these mines, and uh, well, the next morning the local coast watcher they you know, they had these coast watchers parked around the throughout the Solomons, and they were keeping a lookout for this very sort of thing. And they saw they couldn't believe their eyes. All there was one ship sink, a Japanese destroyer sinking in the channel. There was another one burning, and there was. The third one limping around, and I forget what happened to them. I think the fourth one was trying to help the other three. And he, anyway, he sent a, a, an urgent message to the headquarters at Wild Canal to 
put together a strike force and come and get them before they get away. And this is what happened. And as it, as it happened, one of the forces uh, involved in this strike on these destroyers was the 15 Squadron. They were told to get eight aircraft ready pronto, and they were to escort a small force of SPDs up there. That's the Douglas Dauntless, um, with thousand pounder bombs. And there was also a large American force, all American force of, uh, I think it was a, a Corsair Squadron and what were they? Oh, they were escorting a, a group of TVFs. I can't remember the name numbers. Yeah, they could have been 50, 20 or 15 or 20 aircraft in each formation. Well, they set out, but the, unfortunately, the weather was terrible, and it got even terribler. And the the American, uh, the Corsairs, and the TV, TBFs gave up the chase, and they went back home to Guadalcanal. But the the poor old SBDs, which were slow, much slower than the TBFs, and the New Zealand P-40s kept boring through this dreadful weather until they, they finally found these destroyers still wallowing around in the water and Japanese running all over the place trying to get these ships under tow. And they sort of let rip into them. And, um, you yeah, know, they fired off bombs. Of course, the New Zealanders didn't have any bombs. They still didn't have bomb racks. Well, of course, these are a different group of aircraft now. They've got the new K models. Um, I should have mentioned that earlier. And um, and then they managed to get home. Anyway, I, I looked up the American U.S. Navy version of these events, and would you believe it? They mentioned the the TBFs and the F4Us and the S, uh, and the SBDs, which we were escorting, but no mention of the New Zealanders at all. I thought that was a bit of a shame. That was in Samuel Elliott Morrison's um, series of books, was it? United States Naval Operations in World War Two. Um, which is generally a, a excellent reading, actually. It's a very good book, but I just I thought well, he should have mentioned should have mentioned these little allies in there, because they they got escorted these things right through all this dreadful weather, and they then did strafing of these destroyers, which were still fully armed, of course. Uh, it was very uh, torrid sort of uh, fighting, and if you got hit on those, that sort of stuff, you'd never you'd just fly into the sea. Yeah. And the amazing thing was, I found out that a couple of weeks later they had another go at those ships, but um, I have to look into that. I didn't realise they'd been attacked twice. Anyway, and so the, but they did, then they had a few more escort raids up up um, to escorting American bombers, usually the Navy type single engine bombers. But um, it all changed in, into June '43 um, when Admiral Yamamoto uh, had decided to mount a big a big raid, uh, a big effort to push the Americans right out of the, um, well, he was going to attack, heavily attack Guadalcanal and try and force them to stop advancing on, on Munda. And I think, I forget how many aircraft he, um, I think you know, they probably flew down about 200 aircraft or something from truck in, the, in those central uh, Carolines down to Rabaul and they flew them out of there uh, down to, um, from Rabaul down to, um, Guadalcanal, and there's some pretty heavy, uh, there, were th there were three successful raids, I think they were on about the 7th of uh, June and the 9th and the 12th, something like that, and uh, they, they had quite cons different, diff they constituted differently, I think one had a big fighter sweep that went with it, others were just bombers, and um, a fair bit of firing and fighting there, and the 15 Squadron did claim several Japanese aircraft there, I think they had their also had a, a pilot engine. Um, in, in fact, well, oh, I've forgotten to mention that on about the second day of operations at Guadalcanal, actually just on one of the patrols, of course, dawn patrols then, it meant that you actually took off in pitch darkness. Um, they had to take off before dawn. And, uh, and of course, in the tropics, you get very, very black dawns. And um, one of the young sergeant pilots called Sergeant Manns, Freddie Manns, M-A-N-Z, which you might recognise as a German name. He uh, he was one of the kitty hawks taking off on um, off Kukum Strip and had an engine failure just as he was climbing out. I think they uh, the other pilots saw him and they, they just said they saw some f f bit of flame and then the thing the aircraft flew into the sea and exploded and that was the end of Sergeant Manns. Um, funny enough, I met his brother. Uh, back in the day, um, when I was visiting Ross McPherson up in um, who, of the Wings magazine fame at that time, he, he introduced me to his brother, uh, and he 
told me all about that sad event. And they, I think he was the only pilot they lost, um, apart from the one in, in, who was the other one lost, in, in, in Tonga. So they had quite light losses, really. But uh, anyway, it came 12th of June, I think 13th of June, that was their last operation, probably another patrol, local patrol. Um, and they were then sent back to Santo. I think they fitted a few flights there and then on an aircraft and they all turned up back in New Zealand where they, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they got photographed by the Weekly News, which they wished they hadn't been, because as I said, it drew adverse comment from their commanding officers and the powers that be. So that's, uh, they, they went on to another six tours, I think, but that was the most interesting one. And uh, I think, partly because it was so little recorded, and we th I thought they'd lost all records of it, but they have sort of turned up and you can read about them. In fact, um, Chris Rogers' book, uh, was it Air to Air, which some might be familiar with, it's got very detailed uh, descriptions of their actual operations, air to air stuff there. And even the even the um, official history version of their time up there is quite good, a apart from the one serious error, and that was that they spelled the name of their commanding officer of the squadron, the one that was, who was killed in a collision with the Dauntless in Fiji. They got his name spelt wrong, which I found difficult to fathom. <laughs> uh, yes, that's one I wasn't going to tell you. Um, so that was... That was their tour. As I said, they uh, the next time they came up for their second tour, they were flying P-40Ns. In fact, they were the very first Ns that were taken overseas, and that was in August, I think it was, early August 43. Um, but there, um, but they did have a lot of problems with supply too. Um, one thing I remember was that even in Tonga, they tried to get aviators sunglasses for the pilots because they were flying all over the sea on these so-called anti-submarine patrols. And of course, they got a lot of glare and stuff. And they apparently they were, but that only trouble was, it was only in September, this is just a month before, that the New Zealand government and the uh, Americans had come to an agreement about lend lease supplies to New Zealand. And this agreement was drawn up and signed and everything. And it basically said that the theatre commander, this is in this case, the South Pacific theatre commander, uh, was responsible for making sure they were fully equipped and they should be supplied with any equipment they didn't have or any unsuitable equipment. And anyway, when they actually went to the supply, American supply offices, they said, we don't have to supply you with anything. And apparently they hadn't heard about it. <laughs> it took, must have taken some time for this to filter down through all the different layers of command. And eventually they gradually admitted they probably did have to supply them, and but they wouldn't give them any aviator sunglasses. But apparently the 15 squadrons, uh, was it the adjutant? Or was he their operation? I think he was an operations officer. He managed to wangle the pair. He, he must have known people from high places. He managed to get them, he, and he wasn't even a pilot. So the pilots couldn't get the aviator sunglasses, but they, their, their um, adjutant could. That quite annoyed them. And of course, that also, New Zealand was very poorly um, set up for providing proper tropical clothing at this time, too. They, the Americans were supposed, supposed to supply them with proper modern. Um, tropical flying suits and helmets and all the rest. But no, they wouldn't give them anything much at the start. They they eventually did. They, 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 I think the New Zealand had complained right through the right sources and the, these went up the thing and then back down again, back down to the local people and they eventually did get, but they still wouldn't supply them with two pairs of overalls, which the Americans got as a matter of course. And they, they had a lot of supply problems like that. Um, I uh, can't think of any off the top of my head, but those those were two. They, as, they, as I said, they had to get extra extra parachutes. Oh, that's right, they had to get extra parachutes from New Zealand and guns. Well, they didn't get the gun sites. But but they, those all those early difficulties were typical of what happens in these situations. You know, later in the war, things was improved out of sight, of course. But they just happened to be the pioneers and suffered the consequences of being pioneers by running up against the American supply system, which was good, but they... Just didn't know the RNZ if it existed and didn't realize they were responsible for equipping it with modern fighting equipment. Um, I think, yeah, I can't think of anything else I need to say. Um, will that do, Dave? Yeah, that's really good. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions out there for David?
if you've got a question, um, put your hand up. Yep. I don't want to answer around. questions about colour schemes. <laughs> uh, Zach Yates, you have a question. Uh, David, good to put a face to the name at last. Um, it's not a colour scheme question, don't worry. Um, but it is sort of along those veins in that did 15 stay with the P40 all the way through or did they end up going to Corsairs or something they else all went, along the line? They all went to Corsairs, yep. That's right. when, when the Corsairs started to arrive, the, the last P40s were flown by, on operations were flown by 17 Squadron on the 2nd of June, 44, and that was the, that was the end. That was the last P40 operations in the South Pacific. And in fact, they were in a, in a, went even the, well, they're still the South Pacific, but that was the area they were working in at that time was called the Northern Solomons Sub Command, I think. And that was from uh, Torokina Strip. Uh, yeah, in Bougainville, they flew those. And that was, and the, the, in fact, the Corsairs went into service on, on operations in uh, middle of May 44. So it was quite a, a rapid changeover, and the Kitty Hawk was obsolete out, you know. The Americans had withdrawn theirs. In fact, the Americans had, a, I think I mentioned earlier, they had a, a Merlin equipped, a Merlin powered um, P40s at Guadalcanal too. In fact, they had some fancy markings on them. I can't remember what they were, but it was the only squadron I'm aware of that flew them in the South Pacific. I think it was the 44th Fighter Squadron. Apparently, they were very similar performance to the um, Merl, uh, Allison powered ones, but I think they had a bit, bit better supercharger. Of course, that, that's not a turbo, of course, just the um, engine-driven big blower at the back. And yet they got, basically New Zealand was uh, allocated, uh, I think it was 368 F4Us, that was the Corsairs, for delivery in 1944, and that was designed to replace all the Kitty Hawks in the Ford area. And they also sent further shipments to New Zealand. That was another 77, I think it was. And that was, and of course, that was the force that that number of aircraft were used to build up the Air Force to 12 fighter squadrons by the October 44. So there's uh, of which, uh, and uh, I think by 45 they could have eight Corsair squadrons in the Fort area. They had four at Bougainville and two on Imarau or Green Island, and the later the last bases they used were uh, at Los Negros and Jackano Bay on on New Britain. So, that, so Air Force in the last year of the war was basically the uh, 12 fighter squadrons plus six Ventura squadrons plus two Catalina squadrons, plus transports that went backwards and forwards and a, and a few utility aircraft up at Guadalcanal for drogue towing and that sort of and local mail flights here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions, anybody? Put your hand up if you have a, uh, Luke Herbert. Just two brief questions. Uh, under land lease, as I understand it, after the war was over, equipment had to be destroyed. So, was what happened to all the basically happened to all the supplies? And just the second question. Oh, should we should we do that one first? Yeah, sure, if you like. Yeah. Then we'll clobber the other one if I can know anything. Yeah, I do know a little bit about this. Not take up too much time. Well, <laughs> basically, because a lot of people have got a misleading view of land lease. Of course, it was that was the popular name for it, but of course the I think the official name was mutual aid agreements. And, and that gives a better idea because there was actually no, there was no leasing of aircraft during the war, but they were, ish, um, the aircraft came under the, Allied aircraft all at a certain point, all came under the control of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, or was it the Combined Chiefs of, basically there's a big headquarters set up in Washington that had the strong presence of the RAF, but the, basically the Americans and the British controlled most of the aircraft production for all Allied Air Forces, and, and they controlled where it went. And of course, that was based on, uh, well, well, political matters had to be taken into account, but basically the, op the operational commanders, the commanders of operational theatres had the main, they would put in bids to Washington to get so many squadrons of this and so many squadrons of that. And they, uh, they had to, decide on priorities and New Zealand was put in with South Pacific Command. So basically what we got was basically decided by the South Pacific Commander, who was a naval officer, of course, senior naval officer. He, he put in his preferences. And basically the RNCF in the Pacific was designed by the United States Navy. But we, New Zealand was issued with the aircraft. We were responsible for maintaining them and manning them and everything. 
and responsible for uh, looking after them properly. Uh, and they said basically payments will be decided after the war. And of course, Allied Air Force, Al Allied countries, of course, also provided the Americans with stuff like New Zealand in particular, provided vegetables in vast quantities, apparently. And you can't imagine, you know, how many vegetables would you have to provide the United States Army with to get, you know, get a Ventura bomber, you know, <laughs> mind boggles. But anyway, what happened was they, they, they had the uh, post-war, they said everything will be decided in the peace. That's, that's the time to decide. You don't have to decide these things in war. So in '46, they had uh, discussions in Washington with the New Zealand Party and the officials of the uh, whoever were administered lend lease. And they said, well, New Zealand supplied just about enough stuff to um, us, the Army and, and the uh, Navy in the Pacific, enough stuff it just about balances out. I think there was a small amount of cash involved, and I think we even got a few extra bits thrown in by the because the prices of the aircraft were quite interesting. Uh, they actually, they weren't at the, I think they charged them at the value of when they were new, or in the case of the aircraft at Tonga, which they took over, they, they actually depreciated them each for each month that we hadn't had them. <laughs> uh, they, were, they were taken into account too. But basically, New Zealand ended up not actually having to pay much at all. But of course, the agreement was uh, if we wanted to fly them and keep them, that was another story. In fact, we, did, we kept very few of them. In all the Venturas we had left, uh, they went out in the junk pile. All the Venturas went out in the junk pile. Most of the Hudsons did. Uh, all the Kitty Hawks did. All the just well, they, we kept some Catalinas. Although, funny enough, they most of the ones we kept were Canadian built, and we had a slightly separate uh, range, arrangement with them. Uh, we kept a few Avengers. I don't think I think the United States Navy had forgotten about them, and we we didn't we kept some old dauntlesses that the American Navy didn't want. So it was all settled fairly am amicably in August '46. But as you say, if you want, uh, of course, the most famous ones were the DC the C-47s, which became the DC-3s for NAC in, in uh, 1946 and 47. We had to pay for them, but we paid very little even though those aircraft were uh, only about two years old, some of them were brand new. Uh, we only paid about 5,000 pounds, I think, was it 5,000 pounds? It was very little. You know, it was only about a tenth of their actual price. So we got quite a large number of DC-3s and some Lodestars, the only aircraft that we really used, apart from, because the Harvards weren't lend lease, or most of the ones we want. So anyway, I hope that, Go some ways to answering that question. What was, this, oh. what was your second? Well, and truly, I think you've basically answered it. Anyway, I was just going to ask once the Americans moved away from the Kitty Hawks and their frontline squadron, did it cause any supply problems for the New um, Zealand, you know, New Zealand Air Force? Well, no, no, we, it probably, no, no, I don't think so. Um, we, we still got other stuff, like we, for instance, the Americans. Command, was a theater commanders, they wanted all their fighters, for instance, and operational aircraft in the Ford areas to be equipped with the latest uh, high, high frequency um, command sets to, to equip all their aircraft. And our aircraft in the Ford area, all our Kitty Hawks in the Ford area had ch the changeover. Uh, unfortunately, the, when they arrived, and well, they got them eventually. I think they, were, they spent quite some time looking for them because they'd been dumped on some beach somewhere else. And, and, and then they got rained on. They'd been left out in the in the weather. And when they installed these latest sets, they caused a lot of trouble, but they eventually got them. I think they had to dry them all out. And they sent some of the sets to New Zealand for the aircraft here too. So we were sort of taken care of like that. And that would all be put on the big accounts, new radios. Uh, as I, I, in fact, I don't think we even paid for the bombs we used, or the fuel, or the oil. I have an idea that was just taken in as generally fighting the war. Because what the American government wanted was not so much, um, much to do with the aircraft or the bombs, but um, that was uh, they wanted other lives, not just American lives, but other. We we had to put our lives of our men in harm's way too. That was the whole point. They wanted real assistance for fighting the war. They didn't, for instance, the um, they didn't like the Americans didn't like the idea of us having Kitty Hawks on home defence in New Zealand because they said this, there's no threat, we're keeping them away anyway. You can release them and we 
even though they were supplied to Britain under land lease, under their land lease agreement, we sort of took over that. And same, most of our Hudsons were from British British land lease um, allocations. It all gets quite complicated. In fact, they seem to be confused a bit about some of these things. So, um, oh, did I answer the second question? <laughs> <laughs> you did, thanks. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions out there for David before we move on to John? Yeah, nothing about colour schemes. Uh, Brenton, Brenton, Brent, have you got a... Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. I do. Okay, um, what were the reasons given for why New Zealand wasn't included in any more um, forward contact, you know, like we were held back on garrison? Well, duty, it's la largely politics, uh, especially... Um, well, you're probably aware that the, um, what was his title? Uh, Admiral, uh, oh, who was uh, Ernest J. King was, was commanding, what was he called? The, he was a, the officer commanding all the United States Naval Forces. He was the top dog in the US Navy. Well, certainly the operational part of the Navy. He didn't like the British and he, let everybody know that, and, he, and New Zealand was sort of caught up in that to a certain extent, and that did permeate the um, flavouring a bit. He wasn't against the war or anything, he just didn't like the British, and he, and he didn't like the British getting more into the Pacific. In fact, uh, eventually they decided that Australians and New Zealanders could only participate in former British territories. Well, you know, territories have been overrun by the Japanese. Um, they, they should, he, he, pro, you can see what he, he's getting at here. He says that they should be prepared to fight for their colonies because that's what they were. You know, because you see um, all the Solomon Islands were British territory. Because um, the New Hebrides were um, joint French British. And there were lots of other British, you know, the, the Gilbert, Gilberts and the Marshall, well, Gilberts and Elwes Islands were British territories. Papua New Guinea was British or Australian territories. So they said they, they should, those air forces, national armed forces of those countries should be involved mostly getting their own stuff back. And if it was uh, former American colonies or um, the American US Navy was getting so big by that time that it could take all care of all that sort of stuff anyway to the north. Although, uh, strangely enough, they occasionally did have to call on the in Australia and New Zealand. For instance, the Australians were asked to send up a the Americans didn't have enough aerodrome construction squadrons and they were furiously trying to build these new fields in the Philippines and they, they wanted more capacity. So they asked the Australians if they could loan them a um, aerodrome construction squadron, which was, I think, sent up there. We, we occasionally helped, like they asked us to ferry up some, uh, some American Corsairs up to the Philippines too. I think there's only about eight of them. I think Dave, Dave knows about these. They were ferried up. They were just little jobs. We also ferried some old, very old American Navy Catalinas up to Hawaii, for instance. That was just through this chain of command, and it was just a job. And there was no great political implications there. We were just delivering old aircraft back. So it was ba it was basically political. And as you know, the Admiral J. King too. He uh, Ernest J. King. He didn't want the uh, British Pacific Fleet in the Pacific, but he got overruled by Roosevelt, I think. But they, but I guess it gets very political that later part. Later part of the yeah, war. I think so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you. Books about it. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks very much, David. It's been um, a pleasure to hear about the history of Fifteen Squadron there and all the other things around it. Um, yes. uh, I think we should move to our uh, last presenter now, um, sitting in his cold hangar there waiting. So. Um, over to John Saunders. Hi John, don't forget to unmute yourself. There we go Dave, how's, how's that? Yeah, that's good, yeah, we can hear you. Hi everyone, I thought uh, just to uh, wrap up Dave's uh, forum, we'll just a quick walk around the hangar here and show you what we're up to uh, P40-wise down in uh, Blenheim here. Um, as uh, David mentioned there, uh, you know, Blenheim and Fairhall up the road had an early, early involvement with P-40s in New Zealand and 16 squadron was about four miles up the road here. Um, so what we've uh, got in the hangar here, we've got uh, two P-40s. There's actually four P-40s on the airfield water market. Um, 
the uh, two we've got here. Let me uh, turn the uh, turn the camera around. We'll give you a quick walk around and show you what we've uh, we've got here. Right. So um, starting over here, this uh, this here is uh, a P40E that I've uh, been working on for a long time. The uh, actual fuselage was built up in uh, up in Auckland by Pioneer and uh, specifically Will uh, Will Lowen. Um, most of the uh, most of the skin work on this aircraft is uh, new, although a lot of the uh, a lot of the parts in it uh, are original. So, for instance. Um, that windshield there is actually off a, an E-model uh, aircraft that served up here at uh, Fairhall. Um, and Will's done a, uh, a great job of uh, building the fuselage over about the last three or four years, and we've brought it down here to, uh, to Blenheim to fit it out. Um, and fitting out is, is a lot of fun. So, for instance, uh, here we go. Here's, here's one of the benches I've been working on this morning. So we've got, uh, got the instrument panel and this battery tray on the back. Uh, data plates, uh, baggage door, um, and decals. So yeah, as uh, as we get a bit of time, we're uh, we're working on the uh, aeroplane and fitting all this good stuff out. Um, in the background there, that's uh, that's from Harvard DZ ten forty one, and uh, as you can see there, OD four, which is a four four OTU scheme, and and this aeroplane did serve on the number four OTU uh, during the war. Um, we'll just have a quick walk around the hangar here. So here's here's the E-model, E-model being a short-tailed aeroplane there. Um, in the back here, there's the, uh, there's the vertical for it. Um, we're uh, toying with the idea of uh, finishing the aircraft uh, polished, just to show off the uh, the riveting. So we've given a uh, bit of a polish on the vertical there. There's um, a canopy there. Um, I say that's a 16 squadron canopy. We found up uh, up the valley here a few years ago. Um, walking over here, here's uh, here's the cowl hoop. That's uh, cowl hoop, and in the box below there are the uh, the radiators for the aeroplane. Um, that's a a dash 39 Allison there. Moving down here, there's uh, there's the chin cowl and the, uh, and the spinner. We're going to put a Hamilton standard prop on this one rather than a Curtis Electric. So uh, the spinner shape is the same, but a little different. Um, and over in the back there, we've got uh, what have we got over there? We've got there's a top cowl on the top, uh, a couple of Allisons in the box there, hem stand with the propeller. But that's all ready to go on the aircraft. Right, and coming over here, um, the other aircraft we're working on here is uh, one of the uh, John Smith collection airplanes. This is uh, P40N uh, 3220 Gloria Lions. So uh, we'll give you a quick walk around that. There's the uh, there's the engine for it over there, a dash 99 Allison, and the uh, the rear of the fuselage there. There we go. There's the, there's the number, and of course it's in the in the white uh, the white Pacific markings there. Uh, here's the. Uh, sort of the rest of the aeroplane. For those of you who know the history of the aeroplane. Uh, was up in Torquina for four months from uh, February to June '44. Came back down, did a war bonds drive in uh, Christchurch, and then spent the rest of the war on number two OTU. So uh, it's a, a two OTU coded aeroplane. And sort of in the middle there, you might just better make out an SE code. Um, let me uh, just come over to the bench. There's a few photographs that, uh, that help us a lot. Um, these are photographs that have recently been put on the Air Force Museum site, um, and they show uh, this aeroplane here. It is up in uh, Torquen. Um, here's a, another shot of it up in the last one, and uh, there it is uh, just before it came back down to Haki. Um, as I mentioned. It, did a war bonds drive in Christchurch. There is the Seraphine uh, in Cathedral Square, and um, close up of it there. Um, these two photographs here are particular favourites and the reflection there, but um, you can see it outside the uh, old movie theatre there in the background. Casablanca is on in the movie, so it's kind of cool. So we've got uh, you know, some pretty good photographs. We know what the airplane looked like. Uh, 
when it came back to New Zealand. So that uh, that helps us a lot uh, when we're uh, doing it up to uh, static here. What the intention is, is uh, we're not going to repaint it. We're not going to uh, turn it into something it's not. Um, but what we want to do is stop any corrosion on it um, and get it uh, get it looking pretty much uh, representative of uh, how it was when it uh, was uh, down in Cathedral Square for its uh, war bonds drive. So uh, we've been working, uh, working on the cockpit in here. And when I say we, there's a, there's a team of us here at the market. Mike Nichols is uh, leading the push on this one. And uh, so in the cockpit here, we've uh, yeah, we've put a new instrument panel in there. We've uh, we've got the throttle and the trim boxes uh, working there. We're working on that lower switch panel there. Get all the switches and stats and everything working in it. Um, on the uh, side here, you can see the uh, yeah the 55 bomb markings, which uh, represent uh, raids from Torakina through to a bowl, and the uh, two and a half Japanese flags. Which uh, we seem to think uh, have come from uh, Jim Balfour, who flew the aircraft, um, and they, his personal uh, kill markings rather than the markings of uh, this aircraft. Mm -hmm. You can hear us okay there, Dave? Yep, yeah, yep. Yep, okay, right. And uh, so just moving around the front here, um, we've done a bit of work on the uh, firewall there. So there's the uh, glycol tank at the top, uh, the oil tank in the pulling there, uh, and that's all due to go back in. Um, the, uh, the cowlings for this aeroplane were all uh, disposed of in the 50s, so um, we're going to have to do a bit of imaginative work to uh, get cows on it. But we do have a, an original uh, end model cow, uh, a chin cow, a side cow, and a top cow. Um, so we'll put those on the aircraft, and uh, that'll that'll help there. They're just coming around the side here. Oh, we've got a visitor in the hangar. G'day, Graham. <laughs> You're live on Zoom, you're great. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah. So on the uh, on the side here, um, I guess what we've done uh, here is, uh, what we see here, there's uh, the aircraft when it was in the uh, scrapyard at Rooker here was uh, lifted up with a big wire rope, a couple of big holes punched in the side of the aircraft. So we've uh, repaired those. Um, and uh, we've used the, uh, you know, the wartime structural repair manual so that it uh, all looks uh, in place. Found the world's biggest bird's nest down inside the fuel tank there. Must have been a bloody swan or an egg or something. Really big. <laughs> and then uh, over here we've found a bit of stuff that we're going to put uh, with the aircraft. So we're going to put a, uh, a drop tank on it. Uh, we've got the wings for it. They're in pretty good shape. Uh, there's the uh, windshield there. We've got um, some new glass uh, coming for that. We've put in there. Um, there's a couple of uh, bomb racks there. You know, the aircraft was not involved in air-to-air -air work. It was uh, an air-to-ground machine by that stage of the war. So we put uh, a couple of bomb racks on it. We've got a couple of 250-pound uh, fiberglass bombs coming for it. And we'll get the uh, radios put back in it. And, and uh, yeah, things like uh, control sticks. You know, and all that will uh, go back in it. We'll try and get it as, uh, as realistic as we can. Um, the aircraft has uh, suffered a bit of corrosion over the years. It was sitting in uh, John Smith's shed for a long time and had been sitting outside for 10 years. So quite a bit of work has gone into uh, yeah, getting rid of the corrosion, uh, putting a lot of corrosion protection on the aeroplane uh, with the aim to you know, keep it going for another 50 years at least. And, and hopefully the next generation of the Keen Warbirds guys will, uh, will come along and uh, give it another refurbish in 50 years. Coming down the back, um, we've got a horizontal here, which uh, when we had a good look at it, had uh, your 3220 uh, pencil inside it, so it's the horizontal from the aircraft. And the vertical, I think that might be the same, if not, it's from another P40 end. So an end model, a long-tailed uh, aircraft, you can see the, uh, see the difference between the leading edge of the horizontal and the vertical. Uh, what else we got here? We've got a Allison, that, uh, one of the team, uh, Neil Blackford has uh, done up very nicely, um, and the intention will be to leave a couple of the cows off so that uh, you can see them, and see the engine and see what it's all about. Um, this engine's uh, kind of unique. Um, on the back here, it's got a manifold pressure regulator. The, the actual engine was probably good for, uh, I don't know, 60 inches or maybe a bit more of power, but um, on, the, uh, on the training squadrons, um, they limited the uh, limited the power of the aircraft, 
and they did it through that unit called uh, pressure regulator. Anyway, so that's that's what we're up to here. Um, most of the guys have gone home today, or they were sitting somewhere else watching the uh, watching the Zoom feed. Um, yeah, let me uh, hand back to you there, Dave. If there's any uh, any questions, have a good answer. Um, yeah, thanks very much, John. That's fantastic. Um, are there any questions out there uh, for John? If you have, um, okay, uh, Alan Willoughby there. Hey, uh, thank you. lost you, have we, Alan? Oh, there we go. Yeah. You hear me now? Cool. Yep. Hey, just a quick technical question on the, the P40E. Um, I, I noted when you um, posted some photos on the John Smith collection on the, the, the forum, uh, you had posted a photo of the E model uh, showing a, a, flare dis a flare dispenser. Um, but I couldn't quite work out whether it was actually on top of the fuselage, um, if you can see it here, or on the bottom. Um, you able to just give me any information on that, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's Alan, is it? Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The um, the E model P40 that's uh, over in the uh, Smith collection is kind of a unique aeroplane. It's a uh, RAF spec P40E. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, what they did in there is they put the uh, PC rotary flare dispenser in the back of it, and that was used in like Mark One Spitfires and I think Hawker Hines and things like that. And it's in the uh, it's in the roof. Just behind, uh, we typically have the radio mast on the uh, on the P40, so the radio mast sort of sits in about there. Yeah. And the flare dispenser is, op is an opening here, and the uh, rotary dispenser is up and uh, up inside there. All oh, right. Okay. So it's 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 on the it's on this um, the port side then. Ah, uh, gee, yeah, yeah, I, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's cool. I mean, Thank uh, you. Apparently, it was quite a dangerous thing. I think it's about five. Uh, Big magnesium flares in there, and there's a handle that you pull, and it you know would rotate the thing and launch a flare at the top. Um, except it didn't always rotate, so you'd end up with it half rotating a flare and go off inside your aircraft, cook the rest of them off, and now you've got a big magnesium fire in the back of your uh, back of your aircraft. So, yeah, yeah not good, not good, yeah. not good. No. no worries. Thank you so very much for that. Yeah, uh, other questions. Uh, Brent. Yeah, um, you mentioned something about a different shaped spinner. I was just wondering how different. I mean, what was the difference between the shapes of the spinners for the different props? Uh, yeah, well, the uh, yeah the P40, uh, yeah, obviously built by Curtis. So uh, the Curtis Electric propeller was the uh, propeller they used on them all. Um, although the Allison engine is set up for both a uh, uh, Hamilton Standard Hydromatic or Curtis Electric. Um, actually, there's an engine over here. So, right on the uh, front there, there's two prop governor pads. That, that prop governor you can see there is for the Curtis Electric. But the uh, pad on the top of the gearbox here will take a, a governor for a hydromatic, a ham standard hydromatic. So, uh, given that the Curtis Electric is a very expensive prop um, and the aircraft works fine with the Hamilton Standard on it, um, there's quite a few uh, of the P40s now flying around with a Hamilton standard on it. Um, and they mount differently to the, uh, the prop hub, uh, rather the prop hub mounts differently to the uh, prop. So what, uh, what we've done is, um, although the outside shape of the spinner is the same, whether it's a Hamilton standard or Curtis Electric, um, when it's a Hamilton standard, you actually attach it uh, down through the main, uh, main hub bolts. Um, when it's a uh, Curtis Electric, there's a big casting up inside there, and it mounts on that. So externally, you, you can't tell whether it's a Curtis Electric or Hamilton Standard, but um, okay. yeah, the details of it you have to you have to go right back to the spinner when you're uh, when you're building it. Okay. Cool. So, any other um, questions out there? Bears. Yeah, hi John, uh, Baz here, and um, yeah, you mentioned about the, the engine cow things missing on 3220 and you said you had an end cow, so does that mean that there was actually a difference between the E and the end cowlings? Uh, the, there are a couple of subtle differences, the basic shape is all the same, and 
pretty sure you could put an E and an N on the other aircraft. But uh, yeah, they've got uh, slightly different panels and things in the bottom. Um, we've got, uh, I guess, three or four uh, cows, original cows, uh, chin cows. And uh, we found an N, N1 that's, it's not from 3220, but it's off the, off the sister ship. And uh, yeah, we use that to uh, help uh, build up the static aeroplane here. Um, side cowls and top cowls are uh, slightly different again. Um, you know, your N model's got a uh, air filter at the front that uh, that is not on the E model, so the side cowls slightly different from the uh, top cowls, I think, pretty much the same. Right, okay, thanks for that, John. I'll probably see you in the near future. <laughs> cool. Uh, any other questions out there? Oh, yep, one cow. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, John, for um, your work on these airplanes and uh, also for presenting them tonight. A couple of questions that I have. Um, firstly, um, the, the Glory Lions, the P40N, um, how would you estimate, how, I, I was at the, I had the good fortune to meet with John Smith in 2006 when I visited New Zealand, and um, I didn't even notice there was a P40 behind the Mosquito because he spent most of his time talking about the mosquito, which I had no problem with. But um, I took my look at my photographs uh, when I got back home and saw the P40 sitting there. I didn't know there was one in that shed, but I knew he had one. And in fact, I knew he had two. So the P40N, um, how complete then? You say some's missing. So roughly idea, like 60% complete or 30% complete? How complete was that airframe for my first question? Yeah, I guess we're probably talking about 80% complete. Um, the, uh, the wings are here, although they're not in the... Uh, hangar at the moment um, everything inside it was uh, was there I mean uh, as we're refitting stuff all we've done is found it in another box over in John's place and uh, mm -hmm. refitted it um, there's only a few minor things missing to be honest uh, okay. top, yeah so uh, yeah no it's a real uh, you know it's a real barn find yeah, that's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, you had mentioned something about the instrument panel, so I thought maybe that that was something that you guys had to provide, but that also came from the collection then? Um, yeah, there's a bit of a story behind that one. I, I don't think that panel actually did. This is an M panel. The uh, panel we found over there was a, an M, slightly different. Uh, so uh, we've kept the M panel and uh, installed the correct, uh, I mean, the airplane's an M20. So uh, as you can see, there's no uh, artificial horizon on it. They, they took all that out with the lightweight P40s. Mm. Um, so yeah, we've uh, kept the original panel that he had and put the, uh, put the correct M20 on it. I think it's great that what you guys are doing with this. I'm, I'm sure that John would be happy with it too. I would hope so anyways. It's quite nice that you're preserving it and conserving it in this manner. Um, the second question is about the other aircraft and what is this, is there a, a plan for that? Long-term, short-term plan for that? Do, can you share that or is that uh, not public information? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, probably, uh, we probably can share a few details there. I mean, um, what, uh, what we've done with all, all the other airplanes and, and they're not, yeah, they're not our aircraft. They're, they're owned by the uh, Smith family. Um, and what we decided to do there is, um, you know, they're, they're not exactly publicity shy, but uh, yeah, you know, it's not really their thing. They don't, um, they don't, they don't you know, share it hugely. So what, uh, what we agreed to do is, uh, there's a thread on uh, Dave's Wings Over New Zealand website. And my buddy Mike Nichols from time to time puts a few updates on there. Um, and that's probably the best, uh, the best way to do it rather than uh, you know uh, going to verbal so in due course uh, michael uh, update those uh, thread there and as the family uh, decide what they're going to do with the airplanes we'll just put a, a few quick updates in there okay well thank you very much yeah it shouldn't thanks carl um any other questions out there just looking around um another one from brent yeah. Um, is it possible that they changed those instrument panels when the planes came back from the Pacific so that they did have all the um, horizon, all the instruments that they needed? No, no, they didn't. No. I mean, um, this aeroplane's got a couple of things on it that are kind of unique. Uh, yeah, let me just come over to the uh, total port in a minute. You see that uh, there's a little notice there. Notice this airplane is automatic prop governor control. So the, uh, the prop governor here, the uh, lever is locked. And some of the uh, N models, the N20s here, they had a automatic uh, prop governor box in it. 
So uh, even though it's uh, an electric propeller there, there's a the electric switch. Um, on this particular model, for instance, so yeah, they blocked the prop control. Um, no, they didn't. Uh, they didn't change any of the panels out. And I guess if you read um, some of the, uh, the P40 books, the guys had a real um, a real challenge when they hopped in an aeroplane because on the uh, on the ATUs especially they had E's, K's, M's, and M's. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, they hop in the aeroplane, spend the first ten minutes trying to figure out how it's different to the one they flew in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, taking the artificial horizon out of these aeroplanes, I think it's a crazy thing to do. I mean, they're flying up in the islands, lots of weather, lots of cloud, um, and you don't have a uh, an artificial horizon. Yeah, kind of crazy. Huh? Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, right, any other questions? Uh, can't see any hands. Oh, Reg, have you got one? Um, un unmute yourself first. <laughs> Actually, while Reg is doing that, Dave, let me uh, let me put a plug in for Chris Rudge's book here, Air to Air. Um, mm. for all you keen uh, RNZAF uh, the historians, it's a great book. It, uh, Chris spent years and years going through recording all the um, air to air combat uh, claims for the RNZAF, and I'm pretty sure David Duxbury had a fair bit to do with that as well. Um, and uh, so we've been talking to Chris about the uh, the markings on the uh, on the aircraft because they don't uh, you know they don't immediately uh, make sense but um, yeah we seem to uh, come to the conclusion that uh, this could go ahead Jim Balfour um, you had uh, the right number of uh, kills at the right uh, right time when this aircraft was on on the squadron up in Torokina that um, yeah the markings have probably come through from, from home right. Yeah, I agree. It's a totally um, awesome book. It, it's really well worth getting. Um, one of the best references for for the combat <laughs> up there. So, uh, Reg, you had a question? <coughs> no, no question. Just John's doing a wonderful job. Come and give us a hand if you like, Reg. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely agree with that. Absolutely agree. Right, is there anything, anyone else? Yeah, yeah just to, uh, from Des Jide, um, uh, John and Reg, thankfully you're both off on mute. Um, Reg, I take it from what you said that you were assigned uh, a particular aircraft uh, when you were operational up in the uh, South Pacific, is that correct? Yes, that is correct, yes. Okay, so in that case, were you quite close to your maintenance crew uh, on operations? Yes, yes, we were uh, 31SU, or at Santos, uh, when we went up uh, the first time, and by the time we got to Bougainville on our second tour, they had gone up and they'd taken the aircraft with them. And uh, we were pretty close with them. They were all good mates. As a matter of fact, um, one of them was a chap by the name of Les Hawk from Hawk Motors in Takanini. And um, two or three of us were invited to Les's wedding when he, when he came back from the islands the same time as we did. Whether Les oh, Hawk you. is still around now, I don't know. Thank you. Um, I'll get back to you just shortly. But John, in the book Air to Air, does it uh, have good references to the maintenance crew that we're working in this, those areas? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, the, uh, <clears throat> the Air to Air book is, is about the Air to Air combat. So it's, uh, it's about the, uh, the pilots, the operational records books and the uh, claims. There's, uh, there are a couple of pretty good books about uh, guys serving up in the islands. And of course, down here in uh, Blenheim over the years, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, not now, but there are a lot of retired guys down here that have done their time up in the islands. Um, and yeah, all those guys were really interesting to talk to. You know, they, uh, some of the guys did 18 months, two years up, up in the islands. Um, and that's a long time. You know, the, uh, the pilots rotated in and out uh, 
tell you what, they're up there six, eight weeks, something like that. Um, Do you have any uh, books that uh, refer to the engineers in particular uh, above anything else? Yeah, yeah, there are uh, there's two or three uh, books out about those. Um, like if you want to flick us an email, we'll give you, give you. Yeah, I'll certainly books. do that. And yeah. uh, to to both of you, my my interest is because my um, first flying instructor in 1969 had served in the South Pacific as an engineer. He uh, got turned down by the RNZF to be uh, a pilot, so he uh, became an engineer and he spent time up there. So I'd be quite quite keen to sort of find out if there's any references to him up there. He was a fantastic engineer, but more so uh, a fantastic uh, flying instructor. And I think um, some of what he probably did up there um, during that time um, uh, made him the, the sort of person he was. He was an outstanding guy. And uh, for a want of a name, his name was Lewis Valiant. Right. Yeah, focus an email or something, mate, and I'll... Uh Put you in the right direction if we can. Thank you very much, John. Thanks, uh, Ray, Reg, and thanks to Alan Emmett as well for your contributions. Really enjoyed it today. Great. Um, right. Well, if there's no other questions, um, and I can't see any hands going up, um, I honestly, uh, I just am overwhelmed how good this has been. I really, really enjoyed this. It's fantastic. I came up with a really silly idea, a crazy idea, um, and it's worked perfectly. So um, I just want to thank you all for uh, joining us today. And um, thanks particularly to our speakers, uh, especially Reg and Ellen, our two um, our World War II veterans. Thank you for today and thank you for your service. Um, and I want to also thank Liz and Frank uh, and um, Brett and uh, David and John um, for all your contributions today. Um, and yeah, uh, I shall see most of you on the forum, I hope, in the future. And uh, thank you. And I think it would be quite good to everyone take, take your mute off and give our speakers a round of applause. And thank yes, you, guys. Dave, for uh, setting it up. It's been really fantastic, and it's been a great uh, afternoon. Well, uh, an afternoon well spent, in my view. Yeah, absolutely. Agree. Totally. Agree. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, nice one, Dave. Dave. Do it again. We yep. probably we probably will do it again. Um, I know. I, I think maybe sometime in the future. Tomorrow? We might do, no, it won't be tomorrow. <laughs> we, we, we might do one perhaps on the mosquito. How's that sound? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, the course here. Well, well, that's down the track too. Yeah. If we do the course here, we're going to have to get the uh, Alan and Reg back on. <laughs> <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? Oh, thanks very much, guys. Really appreciate it. Well, thank, well, you. Thank, thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. See ya. Bye. Cheers, boys. Cheers, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.